Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Mixstream. This is Mixstream episode 21, okay? Right, my name is JD, okay? Oh, let me stop this for a second. Let me stop the music for a second, okay? <laughs> Apologies, sorry about that, okay? Okay, can we do a little cut so I can do a little edit here, okay? Hold for edit and let's go, okay, right? All right. Hey, welcome to episode 21 of Mixstream. Uh, my name is JD from Studio 2105. Uh, I run the this um, YouTube, the Studio 2105, the Direct Access Mixstream channel. Um, Direct Access and Mixstream is a platform. It's a community of uh, like-minded folks who love anything that's got to do with um, music production, recording, mixing, right? So it's something, it's a local community that I've... Uh, um, a small but a great and awesome community of folks who want to learn together, okay? Now, learning, as I said, is always a two-way process. As much as, you know, people tell me that they learn from watching my videos and uh, my tutorials and instructionals, right? Um, it's also a two-way process. I learn as well, right? By interacting, by um, um, communicating with you, with artists, with other producers and engineers, Right, all over, not only in Malaysia, but around all over the world. And, right, awesome. We were chatting earlier, we've got folks that are joining us all the way from Germany, all the way from um, the uh, East Malaysia as well. But actually, East Malaysian, but living here in uh, Klang Valley, lah, okay? And uh, sometimes, right, um, um, folks from, from Philippines, Australia, I think the furthest I ever had, you know, was were viewers from Canada as well. So it's awesome, okay? Thanks for joining in. Now, um, first and foremost, right, if you uh, haven't done so already, if you are new, this is the first time you are tuning into this channel, do head on down to right this side and uh, become a subscriber i would really really appreciate it it would help with the youtube algorithm and in helping to grow the channel as well do subscribe to uh, my channel here and uh, also click on the notification that so that you'll be updated every time i post a new video okay right so mixstream is a bi-weekly live stream right so i do this every week uh, on friday nights alternating with the uh with some live q a sessions as well which i also do so well, we will do one week of a live stream session, right? Mixing session, mix stream, and then we will um, uh, do a live Q and A the following Friday, and then another mix stream, lah, right? So as you can see, this is mix stream episode twenty one. So this pretty much uh, have, I've been doing this for a good ten months already, because you know two two mix streams a, a month on average. So yeah, we're coming up to about ten months, eleven months, almost a year of doing this on this. YouTube channel. Uh. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, spend too much time talking about, about uh, the channel and all that, right? I want to focus more. Let, let's turn our attention to the song and the artist that are featuring tonight, okay? So, um, who is Dirt Star? Now, Dirt Star, really, really simple, right? Actually, it's all in the description. I'm going to be reading it from here. Dirt Star is an independent solo singer-songwriter. He composes in Mandarin and English. Currently based in Southeast Asia, he has performed on stages throughout China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. A new album is in the works with a bunch of rock and roll coming together during lockdown in the bedroom studio. If you want to find out a little bit more, okay? Um, all the info, right? The links to uh, Dirt Star social media, website, and all that. It's all in the description, okay? Right? And remember, do you click on the subscribe button? Be a subscriber, Okay. Now, so, um, one of the uh, aspects of uh, Mixstream is if you can probably look at the text above you, right? Okay. Uh, is that um, to help to support the channel, um, what we do is that I also run a Patreon. I have a Patreon account and a Patreon page. Okay. So, um, patrons are um, those who wish to kind of support the creation of uh, content on this channel. I do not only these uh, bi-weekly uh, mixing, live stream mix sessions. I do the live Q&As. Um, every week, I put out a video called the Weekly Update Wednesday where I answer questions from that I solicit all over the internet, you know, from Facebook, some come from our own community, some come from our patrons, 
some come from uh, the different uh, forum pages that are um, forum and, and groups that are out there questions which I get from all of the internet and then we I address them and give give you my answers and my opinions on those particular subjects and lots of other videos as well on my YouTube channel okay so you can check it out later after we um, finish this okay really be appreciate it and if you're watching this right now okay please do say hi in the comments let me know that you're there because I can see that there there are some concurrent viewers but only a few of you are saying hi in the chat um don't be shy okay please let me know that you are there that you are watching this right now say hi to dirt star ron of dirt star is also in the chat with us so if you want to find out more we want to check out more of his uh, music uh, right uh, you can always ask ron uh, any questions now while i'm doing this while I'm doing this, right, I may not be able to answer, uh, to pay attention to the chat that often. So please feel free to ask your questions to Ron, okay? Now, so this song that we are featuring, and, and as I mentioned, if you sign up to become a, a, a patron, all right, uh, if you want to help to support the channel and also support uh, the featured artists this week, very simple. If you sign up um, with, with a Patreon subscription, uh, drop a message with the code up there, Mixstream21, Mixstream21. So that I'll know, all right? Um, Patreon is very, very transparent. Uh, it, it shows you, it shows uh, viewers exactly who's a subscriber and, and all of that, okay? There's there's nothing hidden behind it. So if you become a subscriber, right, and you uh, uh, contact me with the code Mixstream21, then I'll know that, right, 50% of the revenue that's that's coming into this stream, whether you're watching it live right now or replay later later down the line, uh, yeah, it, it uh, doesn't matter. Right, so that I know that you want to support right, this artist directly, okay? Well, the reason is, you know, with no gigs, with no live shows, no live events because of COVID uh, all around the world, obviously a, a whole source of revenue and, and income for musicians have just told, has just vanished overnight. Like, so this is just a little bit, it's a, it's a small little way that um, not only can we support the artists, but I hopefully this is, gives you a glimpse of the process of making and creating a song you know the, the songs that we love to listen to that we songs that we always listen to um you know that 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 accompany us right in times of sadness or happiness or, or whatever there's a lot of work that goes into the entire process right not only from the actual song writing the pre-production the arrangement the actual recording this here, the mixing stage is only a tiny slice of the entire process. Okay, so hopefully, right, it sheds a light into how um, um, uh, how much work goes into creation of, of our favorite music, and hopefully, it gives you a bit of uh, appreciation. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, now first things first. Right, whenever you are approaching a song and approaching a, a mix, it's very important to always step back. Take a couple of step backs and take a look at the big picture, right? So that's what we're gonna do right now. Uh, first things first, let's take a listen to the um, rough mix. Okay, we want to pull a rough mix together. This is a process or a step of the process that, right? I refer to as the framing and the discovery. Right? We are trying to frame the entire mix, the entire song together. We are trying to discover what parts come in, what parts need to be featured, what parts need to be highlighted. And pulling together a rough mix right, gives you right, um, give, gives you an idea. It gives you the outline, first of all. Where it gives me the, the outline of what needs to be there. Okay? So as you can see by the tracks, we have, uh, we have all the drums, we got the bass, we got the guitars and vocals. Okay? So this is very, very um, straight up uh, indie rock. Okay? Nothing super, super fancy um, or uh, elaborate. And sometimes that's great. Sometimes that's awesome, right? We just want it to be raw. We just want it to be energetic. So this is a rough mix which I've already pulled up beforehand. Okay, let me pull this up so you can see the mix console as well. It is all the tracks and all the different faders. And uh, let's take a listen to the rough mix. Okay, so this is a rough mix of Kao Kao Fei, right? Or translated into English, it means where we fly or where you fly, okay? Right? Uh, Kao Kao Fei, of course, is in, is in uh, Chinese, is in Mandarin. Let's take a listen, okay? In the meantime, right, I will check it out and see what's happening in the chat as well. Here we go. Straight into it. It's 
the second guitar coming in. Here's a little, this way the guitar line. Second verse. Back to the interlude. Building up. Right, sweet. Okay, so that's the rough mix of the song. Like right? it gives me an idea of where the parts are coming in, what needs to be highlighted, what the whole overall uh, arrangement and the structure of the song is all about. Okay, so now first things first. Okay, let's get into the uh, mix process itself. Okay, so first thing we're gonna start off with, and uh, I've mentioned this before many many times. Okay, on all the episodes, if you are a frequent viewer. All right, um, you already know what, what I'm going to start off with. Lah. We're going to start, first of all, with getting the initial levels right. So what do I mean by getting initial levels? Okay, uh, What we want to do right, um, eventually when we are mixing this is we want to get a mix, the, the final uh, mix, the stereo two-track mix, right, the stereo mix, um, to have sufficient level. Okay, um, First of all, it needs sufficient level but with enough headroom that you do not want obviously you do not want it to clip right any of the master bus neither do you want the, the level to be too low because otherwise later on when you are um, mastering it when you are maximizing and you are applying all the, the limiting to bring the levels up you are going to be bringing up the noise floor as well so sending initial levels is very important okay gain staging all right i sound like a broken record because i mentioned this all the time right gain staging is such a fundamentally important um concept of audio engineering of recording of mixing that uh, you, sh you get it right Right, get 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 gain staging right. Getting gain staging and signal flow right um, puts a lot of things um, later on downstream. All the processes it eliminates a lot of issues and a lot of problems. So, right, that's what we're gonna do lah. So, how do you do that? You you wondering? Okay, now for me it's very very simple. I always make sure that I establish a um, standardized, a calibrated um, reference point, a calibrated level of how loud. 
I end up uh, not only not only listening here on the on the speakers, but also how loud the mixes um, uh, turn out. Right, getting the right levels, and I do that by using the kick drum. Okay, right. So here, kick drum is here. All right, there's actually a kick in and a kick out, but let's for let's just look at the kick in for for the time being. So what I want to do, and uh, should probably send you this, let you all take a look at this as well, so that you all can see it. What I want to do is I want to get the master, okay, to um, kind of peak at about minus 12 dBFS, right? Uh, the kick drum to peak at that level, minus 12 dBFS. dBFS here stands for, right, uh, decibels in full scale. That is in digital audio. That is the unit of measurement that we use whenever we're working inside a DAW. Right? Anytime we're dealing with digital audio, lah, right, for that, for that matter. So now that is what I want to aim for, minus 12. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. You can always go, right, you can always aim for a little higher if you want. You want to go for minus 10, minus 8 dBFS, it's fine. You want to go for lower, minus 14, minus 16, it's also perfectly fine, right? Nothing wrong in that, okay? Uh, this is just a rough guide for me, right? Minus 12 gives me kind of a kind of a good sweet spot so that whenever I you know once I start adding in and mixing in all the rest of the parts all the rest of the other tracks in it won't overload like you'll give me a decent enough right level right audio audio levels that you know, I'm not clipping it neither is it too soft so minus 12 okay so let me pull this over here so that maybe it'll be easier to see right uh, because I'm working on a dual screen so it's sometimes it's a little bit uh, easier for me. I can sort of see where it is, okay? But here we go, all right? So let's go, just pull up the kick drum. It should be around that minus six level. Okay. I'll show you in a bit, okay? A little bit more. There we go. Okay, cool. Maybe about minus 2.5 dB, okay? Let me show you the master. Okay, so pay attention to this, the master here. All right, I'm kind of having a peak at about minus 12 dBFS. Lah. Okay. Roughly at around that, right? it kind of goes a little bit about to minus 11.9. That's fine, okay? In fact, I'll probably dial it down a little bit. Just dial it down to minus 3, okay? Okay. So with that, that is how I set my initial level. Everything else in the mix, the rest of the drum kit, all the other instruments is going to be balanced relative to that. So that's always an easy, a good starting point if you want to start a mix, uh, get the kick drum level um, uh, balanced. There's another additional benefit as well because like as I mentioned earlier about calibrating your levels. Now when I'm listening in here, my listening volume levels, it's all already been calibrated so that uh, every time when I am playing back a mix or playing back um, um, audio, when I'm mixing, the uh, the loudness that I'm hearing, the sound pressure level that's that's hitting my ears from my position right here where I'm sitting is about minus eighty. Uh, no, it's about eighty five dB SPL, right? Um, right? SPL here is sound pressure level. Uh, okay, right? So. You might be wondering, oh, it's so confusing. There's DBFS, DBSPL, DBU, DBM. There's so many thing, things. Like they, they all mean differently, and it's not a topic that I want to get into into this live stream. I've got a video going on in my channel, all right? Part of the Direct Access uh, Music Production Workshop playlist. It's a whole workshop um, with all the different topics covering from microphone techniques, recording techniques, metering, signal flow, all those different, all broken down into um, um, individual modules. So, all right, head on to the channel and check it out, okay? All right, so here we go, all right? Okay, Zechariah, I just took a look at it. Zechariah says, love the vocal attitude. Rock, man, yeah, all right? It was one of the um, amazing things that I really love about uh, Dirt Star is the vocals, man. Ron, really, the, the vocals are really got that vibe and that, that energy there. So, let's start off with the kick drum, okay? Uh, first of all, let's try and shape it a little bit, okay? Let's try and shape it a little bit. Um, this is definitely going for a much, a very, very indie-ish kind of a vibe. Hence, hence the, the title of the stream, right? Mixing indie, indie rock. So when you talk about indie rock, you know, the sounds are not going to be 
you know, super pristine. We're not looking looking at sounds which are um, uh, super, super clean or super precise or su super beautiful. We wanted to have a little bit of a rough, roundy uh, edges kind of vibe, lah, okay? So let's start off with the kick drum first. What am I going to do, right? First thing I'm going to do is I would, I would start off with a half pass at about 20 just to maybe shave off a little bit of the super, super low end. Um, I might go a little higher though, right? Because the way that this kick drum is tuned, it sounds like it's like a very deep tune. It's probably like a 24 inch, uh, um, 24 inch type of, of uh, kick drum. So it's like tuned really, really low, which is cool, all right? Which is cool, but you have to watch out, watch out for the low end. So let me just play it again, okay? So you can see there's quite a lot of energy down to about 50. So I might even bring the high pass to maybe about to about 40, okay? All right, to about 40. Now, one thing that I want to start off, and I've uh, mentioned this before, that uh, I am putting a uh, instance of a couple of plugins that are the start of almost every track, okay? So, I want to show you first. The first, the first plugin that I have here, this is an instance of the virtual tape machine. So this is emulating the signal flow as if I am working inside an analog environment. So this is coming off the first thing off the track. This will be uh, as if the track was recorded on a two inch uh, analog tape. So let's just listen to it because uh, running through it does give it a little bit of saturation. Okay. Uh, speed will be 15 IPS, right? Tape type FG406, two inch 16 track. Okay. So next thing, the second thing that's in line, right? Keep in mind, we are trying to emulate the workflow signal path going through an analog console. So the next thing that I have here, this is Slate Digital's virtual channel. So virtual channel, it is emulating as if it's going through a channel of a large format analog console. I've got it on the US A setting, which is the API, because that's that's what I like, okay? I like the sound of of the API console, you have others as well, the uh, SSL 4000G, 4000E, uh, Neve, all right, um, Trident, all right, uh, Mr. Rupert Neve, of course, all right, for those of you who do follow the Pro Audio and Audio World News, right, we lost Mr. Uh, Rupert Neve just recently, right, um, in fact, um, six days ago on February 13th, right, um, Rupert Neve passed away la, at the age of 94, okay, so, you know, Obviously, he is a legend when it comes to audio equipment and in the audio world and equipment of the highest quality. So, anyway, right? Let's let's move on. Okay. So, now the next thing that's in line. This is again a big shout out and big thanks to Mr. Rupert Neve. This is the FG seventy three. This is the uh their emulation of the Neve ten seventy three preamp. So imagine the signal flow that we're having. Okay, an analog tape. 16 track machine going into a channel of a uh, API console and then running it through the preamp of the uh, Neve 1073. Okay, so you know, like it's gonna inject like some of that analog color that we all love and we associate with so many of the favorite records that we've listened right in the past decades. Lah. Like, even though recording and music making now is very, very, it's gone into digital, right? Um, we're not turning back, okay? It's all gonna be going in digital already. Um, we still love some of these aspects of, of uh, the analog equipment and uh, analog gear. So that's why, right, we see increasingly all of these uh, um, plugins being very, very popular. Okay, so let's keep listening on with the kick drum. Okay. I'm going to try and see what if I drive this a little bit harder. Okay, it gives it a little bit of that, a slightly furry edge to it. Okay, let's keep on going. Let's just go, keep going with the kick. Okay, now I just want to play around. I may want to scoop out some of the EQ, but what I want to do is let's just use the uh, FGA, which is the API 550 EQ. Let's want to sort of uh, clean up a little bit of about 200. Okay, might be a bit too much. Let me roll this back down to about 60. Let's take out about some 400 as well.
Okay, there is a lot of energy at 50 actually. There's a lot of energy. So I need to put a little low shelf and let's see how it goes, okay? Just a tiny bit, maybe 2 dB, low shelf. Just to sort of rein in that sub, that 50 hertz there, uh, just a tiny, tiny bit, okay? Now with uh, with a lot of um, close mics, I usually don't do any compression, but this one might. I might want to put a tiny bit, and what I love to use on some of the kick drums is actually this. This is the U73, right? Um, it's a model of a some kind of a European East German. I can't re re remember exactly what sort of a um, tube, a limiter compressor it is, okay? But there is a setting around here, which is, uh, it's called the Smacky Malt. Let me try this, okay? Because I think I want to try to get a little bit more of the beater attack out of it. So let's check it out, okay? So this might be too much, but we have to dial it back down. Okay, let's... Okay, you can, for me, immediately I can hear it's much more attacky but it might not necessarily be something that we want from this sort of a drum sound, right? Because we, once you bring up to a lot more of the beat air attack, it starts getting into hard rock or metal territory. We don't want it to sound too metallic, lah, okay? So here we go. Let me just bypass that. Bypass. You can see it's a huge difference, right? All right, this is width. Okay, cool. So what I do is let's let's um let's bring down the compression amount, the percentage. So right, let's try and run it in parallel. Let's see. Let's bring this down. Okay, there is obviously a uh, difference in the volume level. So let me just bring this up. We need to compensate. Always make sure that we are making equal volume comparisons because. Um, it's a psychoacoustic phenomenon. Whenever the human ear hears something that's louder, we immediately interpret it as sounding better. But that's not necessarily the case. So that's why it's very, very important whenever we do any sort of processing to always bypass it and to check at the same volume, okay? Equal volume. So we need to compensate this up because of the gain reduction. Hmm. I think it's making it too smacky, I think, too, too much of that, you no, know, that kind of um, smacky beat, beat attack. So maybe let's not go with this. Let me change this to uh, this one, which is, is go towards more of a, more of a uh, limiter with, a, with a, a slightly faster release. Let's, let's take a listen to this. I want something a little bit more subtle. Okay, bring out the output again, once again. Bypass. Yeah, I think this is much better. Just want to bring it under control a little bit without it sounding too metallic, you know, because it's not, this, not, not the kind of a kick drum that we want to go for. We're going for something a little bit more rounded, a little bit more warm, you see. Okay, so there we go. Okay, pretty happy with that. Uh, I want to sort of sculpt a little bit and see what else I can do. Because I think I may need to make some space for the bass. Around the 110, 120 hertz area, um, you can actually see, right? Well, you ca you can hear, but hopefully, but good thing about uh, modern DAWs nowadays is that you can uh, actually visually with a lot of the uh, spectrum analyzers, right? You can actually see the uh, actual where the uh, frequency buildup is. So, this is um, the reason why you have that buildup at 120. It's very, very simple. 
because the fundamental of the kick drum of most kick drums lie between 50 60 sometimes up to 70 hertz depending on the size and the tuning uh. so this guy this one here is kind of at about 50 ish hertz oh hello hello that was really loud <laughs> apologies for that guys okay, so i accidentally click click this uh click this up there so at about 50 60 one octave above that is about 100 to 120 hertz okay so that is where naturally you have the first first harmonic and that's where right it usually builds up so we don't really need that 110 120 so let just let me dial it in it's about 115 actually so let's just scoop it out a little bit All right, cool, all right. So I'm hearing another bit of some boxiness up here. Slightly around 300, just. Okay, bypass the EQ. Okay, a little bit more control. Slightly less boxy, yeah, okay. Right, okay, pretty happy with that, okay, for now. Now, we don't want to spend too much time on this. I mean, there's always some jokes and memes, you know, where engineers, you know, especially studio engineers, right, uh, in contrast with live sound engineers, who will spend like uh, one hour trying to EQ and uh, uh, sculpt and shape a kick drum, okay? Let's not spend too much time on this because first of all the rest we were just listening to a kick drum without any context of the rest of the drum kit of the rest of the parts of the rest of the song okay so um so all of these uh, eqs and all that doesn't really mean a, a, a thing unless it works in context in conjunction with the rest of the track okay so as the saying goes we set and we don't forget so meaning that okay let's arrive at this setting okay uh which i feel hopefully will um uh, work with the rest of the tracks and move on okay move on bring in the rest of the tracks to the rest of the parts then only we can make a decision on how it's supposed to sound okay so let's move on so where do we move on next let's bring in the snare drum okay logically so the snare drum there is the snare top and snare bottom let's just blend it in Okay, let's solo the snare, all right? As you can see, same thing, right? I have the same um, um, uh, the same um, uh, plugins that I have on this in instance, the tape, virtual tape machine, and also the um, virtual channel and the um, uh, FG seventy three. Oh, actually, before that, before before that, one thing that I forgot to mention, right? Now, for the close, the individual tracks. Um, I may not put a lot of compression on it, but what I will do very often is I'll actually put a limiter. So let me just plunk this in. This is what I love to use. This is from Boss, uh, Boss Digital Labs. This is called the Little Clipper. It's a very straightforward uh, hard clipper, uh, right? You can, of course, adjust the degree of uh, clipping, right? So whether very, very light or right, something very hard. This is just to shave off, just to limit the very, very top Right, so maybe you have one of these uh, loud kicks. So this is just gonna limit it. That's all. Okay, it's not gonna really alter the sound. Let's bring this down. Just catching the tops, tiny, tiny bit of the tops. That's all. Okay, now with this guy here goes a little loud isn't it all right this this guy kind of pokes out a little bit more let me just bring this down maybe about 6 db clip gain it five and a half i think this happens here as well i'm not sure why sometimes it could be um uh when you talk about midi sometimes you have a uh, double notes when you double note, sometimes the uh, it triggers the sample. 
Okay, and it happens at the back here as well. Let's deal with this. Let's bring this about five and a half dB. Hopefully, all right, that should be it. Lah. Okay, let's listen to it again. Kick drum. That's better. Right, cool. Again, just to catch the very, very tops. Hey, there's a good reason for this as well. We do a little bit of um, a little bit of processing instead of applying heavy, heavy processing on uh, each of the tracks. So let's go back to the snare. All right, let's mute the kick. Okay, right. We can take out some of the bottom end here. We don't need anything below 75, 80. Okay. Okay, so there's a bit of that honkiness at about 340. Now, this actually sounds like it's um, the sample that we use. It sounds like it's being played with the uh, what we call the hot rods or hot sticks, or depending on whatever brand you call it, right? It doesn't sound like it's um, using uh, actual sticks itself. It sounds like hot rods, lah, right? Which are cool, okay? It gives a different, totally different tone and texture to the kit. Okay, this one. I think I could probably just use one EQ at about 300 and just give it wider, make it wider bandwidth. That's it. Yeah, that's much better. Okay, just scooping about 300. It always tends to be, drums tend to always be a little bit boxy around the 300, uh, 400 region. It's got an ugly boxiness to it. And you guess it, like, same thing. Let's put on the little clipper on the snare. Okay. Again, it's not meant to be compressing anything per se. This is just to really, really catch the tops. Lah. Okay, now, there is actually some ghost notes in it, but let's listen to how it sounds in the overall mix, okay? Let's just go back now with the kick and snare. Let's dial in the snare bottom. Okay, doesn't need much, okay? Doesn't need much. With the snare bottom, I can hear quite a bit of resonances. Okay, we don't want this. The role of the snare bottom mic actually is more of just to capture the, the rattle of the snare wire. So sometimes a lot of these uh, resonances is not really needed. And there's another one here. At about one point, whatever, 1K. Hearing another one, actually. Let me just listen to it and find it. Huh? That's about 820. You probably high pass it a little bit more, up to 200. Because that's all, all we really want is just the snare rattle, okay? Let's blend it in. Okay, nice. Awesome. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to the overheads, okay? Now, uh, for me, I like to mix my drums, right? And this is kind of a technique which I kind of learned. I like to mix it from the top down. And what do I mean by the top down? Um, even though I do start with the kick and the snare, I very quickly want to introduce the overheads first because that gives that actually gives us the overall drum sound that we are that we are kind of going for. See, so let's bring that in. I'm gonna blend in the overheads now. Okay. Let's check the, the polarity. Ooh, it sounds a lot more beefier when I flip the polarity. Especially on the snare. See, it's a bit of a hollowed out on the snare. When I flip it... Doop. The snare sounds way a lot fatter once I, once, I, once I plug that in. Okay. Let's EQ this. We don't really need to all the bottom end on the overheads. There's a lot of 
on a man actually. Okay, some from the snare, you got a bit. See, it's the exact same frequency that's on the uh, closed snare mic, that 1K, 1.06K uh, uh, frequency. And about 450, a bit of honkiness, again, typically, like, that's a typical frequency, okay? 300, 400, the way it sounds a little honky. Now, this sounds a little bright to me. I figured that I probably want to darken it a little bit. So let's do a very light uh, low pass filter. That's much better. That's much better. Okay, cool. Now, I let me just see where am I routing this. Uh, okay, now on my overhead routing, I have another plugin here, which is uh, you know the reason why you see this is because this is um, this is already a stereo track. But anyway, I still run it through my same routing anyway. So on the group, I have this. This is an AOSIS DSer. So what I want to do with this is just to again. To maybe soften the top end, especially when you know the drums uh, are crashing into the cymbals, just to soften up the top end a little bit. Okay. In fact, let's go with the other one. There's another setting here which is auto high compression. This is kind of like compressing the uh, the overall overhead sound, but with you know with the goal of just trying to massage the top end, right? So let's check it. Let's dial the sensitivity down, back down a bit. Okay. Just a little bit up, 50%. Cool, okay, very, very cool. I'm liking how it is, right? So it kind of dials down a little bit like, of the of the uh, high end. Because later on, you're right, you don't want your symbols to be too bright, too washy, or ending up like that. Okay, next thing. Now, this will be very important. This would be the uh, the room tracks. Let's just bring it in. Let's see how it sounds. Nice, okay. Okay, so what I love to do on the rooms is, right, let's really, let's play around with this, okay? We're going to really smash this. And what I love to use is the Pulsar, as the name implies, <laughs> this is called a smasher. Now, this is actually an emulation of the uh, 1176, on uh, the blue stripe, as we call it. It's called the Rev Revision A. So this is, it emulates what we call the all buttons mode, you know. There's actually a, there's actually a very cool trick that you can do on an uh, 1176, which I have one over here, but mine's a black, the black face, not the blue stripe. Where if you push in all the ratio buttons, it creates, right, it, uh, it's, it's not designed to be able, it's not meant to be, to, uh, in, in real life, it's not meant to do it, but this is what happens, uh, okay, so, so it creates a, distorted, really, really aggressive type of uh, compression. So let's check it out, okay? Let's let's turn it all the way up and put a mix 100%. Awesome. You can immediately hear how, you know, it gets a bit distorted. It brings up all the room and the ambience. Let's bypass it. So this is just plain without. Okay, so the sustain of the snare, especially the sustain of the cymbals. But let's dial it down a little bit, okay? Okay, we're gonna need to EQ this. Okay, right, it's the kick drum especially, it's bringing up a lot of the room.
So all that 200 hertz is all being... And 300 as well. Okay, you could probably bring this all the way down to 10k. Okay, so, all right, so here we go. Let's blend in this real room. So, see, the room, room, the room microphones and room tracks are really important in giving the actual, in giving size and giving depth to any uh, a drum track because everything else, right, the kick, the snare, the overhead microphones are what I would call consider close in mics. Like in some situations, of course, some people when they mic the overheads, they will probably put the overheads a lot higher. La. But um, generally speaking, this is what we call closing mics. So the room mics or ambient microphones are really important in really bringing out the size and the bigness of a drum kit. So, you know, if there's always an opportunity to do so, right, always include a room microphone, right, in your recordings, okay? So let's blend it in. It should be just right. So not only that, you see there's a front and back to the drums. You can, you can hear that there's actually depth to the room. Right, there's a front and a back. You can hear the kick and the snare up front, but you can hear there's a bit of depth behind it as well. Okay, very cool. All right, now let's blend in the hi hat. Okay, let's take out all this bottom end. We don't really need it. And there's, there seems to be this particular frequency that's kind of popping up. Again, this could again be something, a characteristic that's in the sample library, um, the samples that are being used. They seem to have this common thing at 1.06, that's sort of a resonance that's, that's around there, right? So no worries, right? Very easy to deal with. Okay, cool. Now, so the way that um, that's coming up from the, uh, the the drum sample and drum VSC that was being used, the Tom are the Tom Rooms uh, track is on a separate one. So I think we could just probably use the same setting and let's see how it goes. All right, let's just blend it in for a second. This would go into drums. Let's see. Okay. Ooh. It makes it sound a little bit too big, actually. So that's probably a reason why I had it muted early on. Hmm. Okay, right. That sounds way too aggressive for the toms, right? In fact, let's just ignore this for now. Let's move on to the actual toms first. So we're done with the kick and the snare. Let's go with toms. Okay. First things first, right, with toms, it's always good to always check the polarity with the overheads. In fact, let me just go to, let's go to this section, right, in between. Let's put in a loop. Okay. All right. Flip the polarity of the tom track. Let's check and see. Hang on a second. Where is my tom? Where are my tom tracks? Why is it not uh, why is it not sounding? Okay, here we go. All right, one more time. There we go. Flip. Bring it a louder. For me, there's a slight difference between two. I feel like when I flip the polarity, I get a little bit more bottom end, and that's usually usually an indicator right, of it being much more in phase. La. So let's go with that, okay? Let's go with that. So let's solo the tom now. Okay, take out the bottom. Okay, you can hear this frequency, which we don't... Okay. 
280. It's around 280, 300, that region. We just can be a fairly wider, wider bandwidth. There we go. Now this one is a actually again this is this is what I mean this is the first the harmonic 185 and this is about 90 right 90 90 ish so this is about 180 so that's about an octave above now sometimes if you take out the octave the the octave above it makes it a little too thin so in this case let's keep it lah let's just keep it there let's not do too much to this tom okay. So here we go, let's blend it in. Let's go out from the loop. Okay, right. Again, this is not a power ballad where it needs to be like, oh, huge sounding toms. This is just there to fill in the space. Let's move on. Let's continue with the, uh, let's continue with Tom 2. Tom 2, Tom 2. Same thing, let's repeat with the same process. In fact, let me go to this one because there's two hits. It's a lot easier to tell. Let's loop it. Okay. Let's flip the polarity. Same thing, I think. When once I flip it, it sounds like it's a little bit more bottom end uh, to it. So let's go with this, okay? So at about two sixty, let's cut that out. Can okay, this one? This one I may want to cut down a little bit. Not too much though, just a tiny bit. Okay, let's listen to how it goes. Let's dial it back down. Dial it back down. Okay, that's very cool. And now last but not least, the floor tom, which is all the way at the back. So let's repeat the same process, okay? Overheads, check it out first. Flip, flip it. Same thing, right? I think generally speaking, right? The when I once I flip this, because if I think, because when I flip this overhead here, right, it uh it means that the toms here also I also had to flip the polarity of that to keep it consistent. So let's go with the toms. Let's EQ it up. So there's all that 200, 220 hertz uh, frequency that's not contributing, right? Not really contributing. And about 490 hertz as well. We could all scoop that out actually. Now in this case, I feel that the floor tom will need a bit of boost. You know, I add about a hundred so that it helps it to cut out a little bit. All right. Let's check it out. Okay, here we go. Let's try that real drum roll again. Maybe it doesn't actually. It's not meant to be. Just a little bit. Let's dial it back down. All right, okay, that's cool for now. That's cool for now. Okay, now next thing that I want to do, I want to again give a little bit more space to the drum kit and how we're doing it, we're going to put in a little bit of reverb here. Uh, this is by default, this was this is actually what comes up. This is Steinberg's reverence. This is a convolution reverb, so a convolution reverb 
works by loading in impulse responses, IRs. So nowadays, we always see IR, IRs, right, in reference to guitar, amps, guitar cabinets, and all that. But in fact, one of the earliest users of impulse responses, IRs, is actually in reverb, okay? It's basically, right, what they send is they send a uh, test signal, usually a um, an impulse of white noise, and they capture it, the impulse response, they capture it, and that gives you an indicator, right, and a very, very accurate model of either a piece of equipment or in this case, right, an actual physical space, the characteristics of it. So they use that impulse impulse response to model reverbs, to model the sound of guitar caps and guitar amps, okay? So that's what we have. So this is a very usable one. This is a LA Studio uh, setting, which kind of gives you a um, uh, the sound of a room, Right in a in a studio. So let's dial it in, okay? Okay, just to give a bit of depth depth to it. It's very subtle. not too big we don't want the drums to sound too big as well because again it's not really appropriate indie rock is meant to be a little bit more raw because if it sounds too big then you get like stadium arena kind of rock sound which is not what we're going for la. okay now let me uh, eq the reverb a little bit there we go so the eq reverb also needs to be eq'd let's go back to the beginning So this is about 1.1K. About 330, there's a bit of a build up there. Okay, let's check out the snare, all right? Let's go with the snare now. So now this is a snare group. Okay, cool. All right, so let's do this, all right? I'm going to put the... And uh, where is it? The Black Box Analog Design HG2. So this is a saturator, kind of a des uh, design box. Uh, and we're going to put this. Ooh, that's really, really nice. Okay, let's go with high. Just to give a bit of life to it. Okay, bypass. That's a huge difference. Okay, this is without. Ooh, okay. Listening context, okay? Ooh, this is without. A little dark. See how that really brings the snare, gives that bite to it. Let's go with flat and see. Interesting. This gives the low end as well. Oh, I like this. Oh, I like this a lot. I really, really like this, okay? It feels like I want to try and play around with this uh, along with the kick as well. Let's see what, what it does, okay? So, maybe this will help to bring up some of the upper harmonics. That's what I want to do. So, let's go with just a kick. Let's go with high. Let's go with pen. Nope, that's way too much. I 
Again, this is kind of making it mm, too attacky though. Let's dial it back down. Dial is back down a little bit. Okay, now I'm hearing something and let me try and find out, figure out where is it coming from. Yeah, it's coming from the overhead. Now with some of this, it's bringing out... There, it's bringing out that 330, 330 hertz there. Yeah, is it the room as well? Let's go in, let's check. Yeah, this three. That three twenty hertz. Need we need to. I need to cut this down a little bit more. That's better. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, I'm pretty happy with the way that it's sounding right now. Last piece of the puzzle with the drum kit would be. Another compressor, and the favorite compressor that I'm using for drums is the API 2500. Okay, I've, uh, let me dial this in, okay? So, this is, uh, I usually already have this at a particular setting for my drum kit. So, let's check it out. It's just a matter of just adjusting the threshold. Let's bring this up by 1 dB. Okay, the toms, well, we need to go a bit back down because the toms are really forward right now. Could even go forward to go a little bit further back. Okay, let's bring the attack time up. Nice. Okay, so instead of the fastest attack, let's slow it down to... Well, I say slow, it's not really slow. It's still relatively fast. It's 0.3 milliseconds, right? Sometimes I will go up to 1 millisecond and see. But we'll just leave it at 0.3 for now, okay? Cool. So that's the drums, man. Okay, now uh, let's move on very quickly. Let's go on. Right after this will be the bass. And hey, we got a. Let me just double check some of the messages that we've got in here. Hello, hi Nuno. Nuno, all the way from Jakarta, man. Thanks for joining us. Right. And uh, right. Nah, my phone has already gone into sleep mode, so I can't really see the the messages in here. Let's go with the live chat and hi and uh, Cutmaster TKO. Good morning, guys. Good morning to you as well, Cutmaster. Where are you watching this from, man? Where are you where are you watching from? Thanks for joining in the uh, live chat. Uh, your first time to the channel, please do right. If you want to check out the rest of the videos and the content that I have, right, do subscribe on the the channel. Okay, All right. Okay, let's move on very quickly. So this is what we're here for. It would be the would be the mixing. Let's go on to the bass. Bass, the final frontier. <laughs> okay, now, so as usual, same thing, okay? The same uh, plugins that I have, the uh, tape and console emulation plugins. Let's go, let's dial in the bass and see. Let's just blend it in, first of all. Okay, 
okay, something is something is still bothering me a little bit with the drums. The, the drums. I'm not sure whether is it is it due to the samples or due to some of the um, compression that I'm using, but I can hear some kind of phasing going on. You know, sometimes. Yeah, it's coming from the room. Okay, I think we need to dial it this this in back now. So this is parallel. I think the hi hat. That's what the hi hat is coming. Let's just pull this all up to about 200. Yeah, that culprit, that culprit 320 hertz is, is kind of popping its head out sometimes, right? And it's the re and it's sometimes the end res the end result of right putting on the compression. So some of these uh, lower level resonances start popping up, right? Okay, let's go back to the bass then. Okay, now so one of the initial things that I had really concerned was is that the bass here again has got a lot of sub information. Uh, which is a bit too much. So again, I don't know, right? I, I, it could be a, a factor of um, um, monitoring when the when the uh, bass was recorded, because what happens now is that the bass and the kick drum um, it's fighting a lot, especially in the fifty and sixty hertz region. So now I have to kind of shape it in such a way that you know. Um, now that I've kind of have the kick drum kind of occupying the low end where I want it, I have to sh sort of shape the bass to sort of fit into the space line. Okay, I got to get the bass and the kick to work together. Okay, so actually just running it through the tape and the console emulation helps a lot. But what I want to do is maybe let's drive it a little harder and see. Okay, let's me pull. Let's just drive it up so we can get a little bit more of the harmonics. Okay. Interesting. Okay, let's just leave it like that for now. Let's just listen to how it sounds. See, in context with the drum kit, you don't really hear these kind of the overdrive that's going on. In fact, it's you know it's kind of adding to the harmonics. Let's uh, check the polarity and see. Yeah, especially when he hits the note. Da, 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 this note here, this note here, it really blooms. Now again, you need to be hearing this either on a good pair of headphones, right, monitoring headphones or pair of speakers that can really go down to that frequency. Like if you're listening to this on a mobile device, you probably not gonna hear what what what's going on. Instead, just your speaker, your phone speaker might be distorting instead, okay? Now, here we go. So, how are we going to solve this? Now, first of all, uh, what I have over here will probably help. So, this is the Waves C4 uh, multiband compressor. Now, um, I have this on all of my base groups and base treatment exactly for this kind of a situation. So, this is a multiband, so it means that it splits the audio into several, several bands and applies, you can apply different um, amounts of compression to those different bands. So in this case, what the Wave C4 is doing, 
I'm going to be using this just to control the very, very bottom low end. I'm talking about, you know, the the lower um, the lower two or three octaves, okay, of the bass guitar, the actual low end. So this helps to kind of massage and control the low end a little bit. So let me run it through it and let's see. Let's just solo the bass. Let's bypass. Let's bring the threshold down a little bit more. Just control it a bit. Okay, that immediately kind of improves things a lot better already. It's cleaned up that bottom end a little bit because all that space is being occupied by the kick drum and we don't want the bass guitar to be you know fighting and clashing with each other now the next thing that's very very useful in bass which i use is this this is called the surfer eq boogie eq2 by sound radix now this is actually the light version they call this the focus right edition because this is actually free for all focus right users if you own any piece of focus right equipment right or focus right gear Register, go to the website, right? Go to your user section. You can download this for free. Now, this is a very powerful uh, EQ because it's referred to as a surfer EQ because it's an intelligent EQ that can track the frequencies that you uh, want to um, that you want to deal and you work with. So, in this case, all right. For starters, pay attention to this little green uh, ball here, right? This green circle here, because this is the Surfer EQ band. See what it does, right, with the bass. G sharp, E, B, 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 A. See, it actually tracks the frequency, the root note uh, of the bass guitar in real time. So this can be very, very powerful. So instead of just an EQ, which just a fixed EQ at uh, let's say you know 80 hertz or something like that this will track the fundamental the note or frequency and apply the boost or cut accordingly so we can we can not only use it to track the fundamental but you can also track the upper harmonics and that's where I usually will use it for the bass okay so let's go with first of all let's turn this to the narrowest bandwidth so sometimes with the bass, if you want to sort of clean up and avoid the muddiness, sometimes it's the some of the odd harmonics, especially in the third, the fifth, or the seventh harmonics. So here, this is where we can adjust it. Let me bring this up so you can have the second, right? Second here is uh, the, the second harmonic, which is in an octave above E, right? 84 hertz. So third would be 127, fourth, 169 and fifth would be about 211 right so these odd harmonics don't really contribute to the sound so sometimes instead of um, instead of uh, adding to the bass sound it adds it's an odd harmonic right so let's try and um, cut this out and the cool thing is because it tracks the fundamental note it will always target that fifth harmonic right and control it so very very powerful tool okay very very powerful EQ so not much just about 2 dB so you see the fifth harmonic is is kind of giving this note that is like an octave and uh, um, octave and the third that would be da, 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 eight, ninth, a tenth, right? It's like a major tenth above, lah, right? So it's a third above the octave, you see. So sometimes that will sound weird. It will sound clashing, especially if it's supposed to be a minor chord, for example, right? Like in this case, the chord progression is a B A. You have a G sharp minor, and then you have an E. So if you have the the tenth the, the major tenth above a G sharp, you are ending up with the note, the G sharp, the, 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 the C f natural, which doesn't exist, you see. It's not inside the since inside the key inside the key. So right, targeting that fifth harmonic helps to right bring down those frequencies which make it sound clashy, right? So that's where it is. This is the fifth harmonic, okay? So let's bring it down. 
So about 2 dB is kind of okay, two and a half, right? Again, small, tiny adjustments, increments make a huge difference. Okay, cool. Now it still bugs me a little bit because the that um, particular G sharp note. Let me just take a look, okay? I think it should be fine. I think let's move on first, okay? Let's move on first. Again, set and don't forget, don't fixate on one thing too long because again, we want to hear how it sounds and how it interacts as a whole. Let's move on, okay? Next thing I want to do with the bass, what I love to use on the bass is the 1176. You saw the Pulsar, which is the uh, version that um, uh, I used on the room track. Now this one is the 1176A that's from Universal Audio. So let's activate it. Let's apply a bit of compression on this baby, okay? Solo the bass. Let's dial it down for us. Bypass. Nice, okay? Right. So the A version, right, the blue stripe, they call it, it's the Revision A, which is actually a uh, one of the earlier, earlier models of the 1176. Now, because it's an earlier model, right, um, in terms of the specifications, the tolerances are not as great. Lah. So it ends up, you know, we describe the A as having a little bit more dirt, slightly more distortion in it. Right, the, the characteristics, which is sometimes a good thing because you want to add a little bit of that, the dirt and color. Now, whereas when they go into the black phase, which is the later revisions, the revision E and so on and so forth, it um, with improvement in electronics, it becomes cleaner. So, right, there's always different flavors, like even though, right, to the 1176 compressor. So this is the revision A, which is the earlier, the, the blue stripe version, which is really great on bass. So that's what we're doing, okay? So... So we're right hammering it pretty much, right? So that's up to 10 dB. Oh, that helps a lot already with that uh, booming uh, G sharp, which I mentioned about, right? Nice. Okay, much much better. Still a little bit, but we can deal with it. So next thing that we have here is the Bass Rider. So this is an intelligent, another electric play, uh, plugin from Waves. This is uh, this helps to track the level and to keep it really even. Okay, so you can see the controls are super super simple. You have in the middle here. This is called the Rider, which is basically a volume fader. So with bass rider is you imagine that you have someone you have someone who's got super sensitive ears and has got super quick response time to be able to uh, ride and adjust the uh, the volume of whatever audio that you are putting it on in this case the bass right this is different from a compressor a compressor waits until the audio signal exceeds the threshold then it applies compression but the bass rider is it has the ability to sort of look ahead, right? Imagine you have a time machine that you can look ahead a couple of milliseconds ahead and anticipate what the level it, it uh, of the incoming signal and adjust it accordingly. So that's what Bass Rider does. So all right, so all we need to do is to set a target right level of where we want it to act. Okay, then we can sort of see it dancing around. So which particular note, you'll bring it up and down accordingly. There we go. Very nice, okay? Super, super simple, but really, really handy, okay? Let's go with the MV2 next. So MV2 is again another plugin from Waves. This is by far one of my favorite plugins, right? And you know, I can't imagine 
how we could have mixed without without this line in the in the past. Now, what MV2 is is that this is actually um, it's a combination of several things. Now, underneath the hood, we can't really see because you don't really see the controls. It has not many controls. You just got a low level slider, a high level, and your master output. That's it. There's no threshold. There's no ratio. There's no attack and release to, to, uh, to uh, adjust and to play around with. But what it does is that this is like a combination of an expander, parallel compression. It does something like that. Uh, in the past, in order to sort of achieve what we want to do with MV2, okay, what I want to try and do, you have to kind of pull up a much more complicated signal path, signal chain, parallel this, you know, multi-compressors and, and expanders and, and all that. But this is made so simple, right? This why right, this plugin has made this that sort of sound uh, achievable. So what it does is that it's split into low level, high level. Low, low level is the magic. Lah. To me, this is where the magic is. Low level compression, as they call it, is it brings up all the low level uh, details, all the low level signals. So, you know, um, a lot of the detail, it brings out detail, it brings out all the energy. To me, that's what I'm looking for. I What I'm really looking for when we talk about parallel processing and expansion and all this is to bring out the energy, right, from the track, from the track that we're dealing with. So this is what's going to happen. High level, comp uh, high level compression here, this is the normal compression that we are all familiar with. Lah. Now this one, I almost never touch and never deal with this. But this is going to come in handy. It's going to come in handy with a lot of things as well, okay? So let's check it out, all right? Let's bring this up, all right? Solo the bass. So things like the pick attack, now I have to compensate once again, where we always do an equal volume comparison. But what I do here is things like the pick attack, right? Some of the, the, the noise, some of the lower details, some of the upper harmonics also start to come up. These are all stuff which is usually buried uh, lower down, right, in the, in the audio, but this helps to bring it out. Brings out all the energy, the excitement, and brings out the detail. Okay, here we go, let's go on. So without, it's very subtle, okay? Okay, okay, here we go, All right? Now let me go back to this Surfer EQ, right? Let me check and see because not only that, I think sometimes it could also be the the seventh harmonic. Let me just double check this and see. Let's go back to the that riff. Yeah, I think this bugs me a little bit more. Okay, needs a little bit of EQ here and there. The 700 hertz always pops up. And about 430, 440 hertz. Okay, cool. Now, the it's a lot more even right now. But I still want to deal with that G sharp, which I feel still feel it pokes out a little bit. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll put in an instance of TDR Nova. So Nova is a dynamic EQ, you will see that I'll use this quite quite a lot later on, especially when I deal with vocals as well. Dynamic EQ is very powerful because a regular EQ, you a regular parameter EQ, you can set your frequency, you can set your bandwidth, you can set the amount of boost and cut, but that's it. Once you engage an EQ, you will always permanently boost or cut that section. A dynamic EQ is different. A dynamic EQ is, you can think of it as a frequency specific compressor. That's right, you know? So it's a compressor that you can tune to a specific range or specific bandwidth or frequencies. And that makes it a very, very powerful tool. So this means that the compression in this, in this uh, instance is going to act only when that particular frequency 
exceeds the threshold. So in the sense that when something pokes out a little bit too much, that's only where the EQ will engage. Once it's gone, once 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 it's that that uh, offending frequency is not there, right? It um, let's go. So the result is that you get a very transparent type of uh, uh, compression or processing. So very, very powerful. And the best thing with TDR Nova, it's free, okay? Link to all of that's down in the description below. You can check it out. But let's move it on. Let's move on, okay? Let me solo this band. So... Okay. Okay, let me just double check again. Where is that? Uh, where is that uh, G sharp note? Uh, okay, where? So that would be, yeah, at about 50 hertz, okay? At about 52. So let's see, all right? At about 52, let's go with a narrow Q bandwidth, all right? Let's go as narrow as possible. There we go, okay, so now let's take out the gain. Nope. Zero, no gain, let's disengage solo. So here we activate the dynamic EQ portion. Uh, ratio, I'll go for something a little bit more aggressive to attack and release, we just leave it as a, de a default, okay? Because 10 milliseconds is pretty good already, okay? Okay, so this will should only engage when we get to the G sharp note, okay? There we go, you see, just a little bit. So no compression. Yep. Dun, dun. Then G-sharp, all right, it helps to tuck it down a little bit, maybe a little bit more. Because A and G-sharp's next to each other. A bit more. Yeah, that sounds a lot more even to me. Nice, okay, very, very cool. Uh, let's add a bit more color. I feel this bass needs to poke out a little bit more and uh, let's put in the... API EQ, here we go. There we go. Okay, now just to give it again a little bit more tube oomph, okay? So let's dial in the this a little bit. Bring the output down. So you see, just bring out a lot more of the harmonics of the bass because the upper harmonics is what really helps us listen and hear the actual note, not really the uh, actual fundamental. So we can, you know, take out a little bit of that super, super low end from the bass, let the kick drum live within those uh, registers and those frequencies, and, you know, let the bass guitar take the uh, the higher octave, lah, all right? The uh, 80, 100 hertz, you know, kind, of a, kind of a region between 100 to 200. So, you know, they kind of live together much better now. Yep, okay, sweet. Very, very cool. Now, where should we go on next? Okay, now let's go on with the awesome, right? We're going to go in with the guitars as well. Hey, uh, let me just check it out. Right. Okay, right. Go ahead. Hey, you got a master. Okay, uh, this dude is a effing magician. Uh, no, man, it's not a... Uh, <laughs> You know, the uh, as a moderator, I had to uh, let that the message through <laughs> because I guess YouTube and the censorship, right? Okay, here we go. Right, let's move on. Da, da, da. So that's drums and bass ready. 
let's move on with the guitars. Let's go with this first guitar, first of all. This is would be guitar one. Let's check it out, all right? So this cool kind of a, almost a reverse guitar. Awesome, all right. Okay, so let's let's go straight into this line. Let's play around with it. Let's take out all the super bottom end. Okay, so TDR Nova is where this will come into handy again. So let's play with this. In fact, I will probably just use all the EQ from here. So let's let's take away this because I got a lot more control here. Let's loop that section. So we can have a high pass all the way up to 100. So you got a little reverse guitar part again. In fact, let's just solo this section. Just solo the line, which is at about 29. And let's just loop that, okay? So what I'm hearing is this. At about 2K, right? So that's again very typical with some guitars, uh, some especially uh, single coil guitars, you will have that, uh, you know. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ron, this was recorded with your telly, right? Was it a telly? Can't, re can't remember, right? Uh, it's definitely a kind of type of a form of a single coil guitar. So at 2K, but the thing is you don't want to cut out too much of it. Uh, the reason being that it is a characteristic. If you dial out too much of these uh, resonances, you lose the identity of, uh, of a single coil. See? So let's go with the ratio of 3, attack, fastest attack, release. We bring it to about 70 or 80 around there. Okay, not super fast, okay? I don't mind the uh, TDR Nova, uh, the, the dynamic EQ kind of holding on to the note. But 80 milliseconds is not really long. It's pretty, it's quite fast actually. So still considered medium, la, medium release. See, yeah, so it's just gonna very, very subtly turn down that 2K a little bit. You don't want to cut it out all the way because you will, like I said, you lose the characteristic of the single coil, all right? Now, at about 1.7, this is kind of irking me as well. It's very close to the 2K. But it can be, it's, you know, it's an adjacent frequency. So it does kind of irk me a little bit. So let's do the same thing. Let's go with that. Okay, so let's bypass. Right, okay, cool, right? So just to notch out a little bit of that. Okay, very cool. Next thing I'm going to drop in is, right, what I love on electric guitars, right, would be the LA3A. This is also by Teletronics. Super simple. This is great on, uh, on electric guitars, okay? This is super simple again. It's just your peak reduction and gain. 
Uh, what this is going to do is very subtle, right? It's super, super subtle. It's not going to be more than a dB, right? Right? It's just to kiss it a tiny, tiny bit. Right? It just gives you a little bit more uh, density, la. that's all, okay? So let's go on. That's what are we going to do next? Let's give a little bit of space to these guitars, okay? So what I love to do is to use Super Tap. So Super Tap here, this is actually a delay, right? But what I'm trying to emulate here, this is actually a, um, a setting which I, uh, a preset which I did myself. This is called Room Reflections. What I want to sort of emulate is as if I'm placing it inside a, in a nice sounding studio room, okay? So what this delay is kind of generating is generating an early reflection, right? Uh, so um, a s one single reflection, you see, we don't want multiple reflections. So the feedback, there's no feedback because again, we don't want it to be bouncing down. We want it to bounce off the wall once, right, of the room and bounce it back down. So again, just to give it, give it, let it sound as if it's inside a space. Uh, one of the important things is again, uh, low pass. So that means cutting all the frequencies about 1.5k. You don't want it to sound splashy, okay? So let's listen in context. Okay. Go to this line. Okay, very nice. Okay, now next thing, let's see what happens if I just dial in a bit of this reverb. Now, this is the same reverb uh, against the reverence that we use to feed to the drums, okay? It's just the same. I'm not a fan of using different multiple types of reverbs. I prefer to use only one or two the most because to me, it helps the sound gel a little bit better. Um, it kind of uh, works a little bit better. It ties everything together if you use one type of reverb. Lah. But yeah, again, your mileage may vary. There's no right or wrong. There's some people, there's some folks who prefer to use different types of reverbs. For the drums, they use one type of reverb. The guitars, they use a different type. The vocals, they use a different type. But generally speaking, with instruments, right? With instruments, I kind of use back the same reverb. Lah. To me, it kind of gels the sound a little bit uh, easier that way. Let's go back to this. Yeah, okay. Again, very, very subtle. It's all just to give a little bit of a, um, a little bit of depth to it, lah. a bit of 3D-ness to, to the guitars. Let's move on. I want to add a little bit of slapback, actually. And this is a new plugin by this company called Baby Audio. This is a super, super simple delay, but awesome sounding, okay? So this is going to be a just a tiny slap back. We'll go with like 16th notes, uh, 16 straight notes, and let's listen to see how it sounds. Okay, All right, let's. Okay, just want to get a slap back on this. Okay. Turn off the reverb first. Hmm, it sounds a bit too. Let's go with analog. Okay, let's go with analog reverb. Yeah, so a little bit springier. Dial down the feedback a little bit.
right, cool. Well, again, again, we'll see how it fits, lah. Okay. Now back to just a little bit of EQ, I think, just to cut it out a little bit, maybe three K. Now it feels that with this delay, I don't need the reverb anymore because now it makes it too roomy, okay? Okay, that's good, all right? So this is kind of, kind of a little lead lick guitar that, that happens uh, from time to time. Let's go to this rhythm, right? So what I've done is that uh, I have already bussed them to to a uh, group here. So let's check this out, okay? So this is the rhythm. So this one is... Right, okay. Nice little overdrive. Let's take out some of the bottom end. Right, not too much, right? About 70. Here we go. Now, in this case, I'm not going to use TDR Nova on this one because um, uh, maybe I will, but now for this, I just want to do a little bit of corrective EQ. All right, so again, one of the same things. This is at about 3.2K, single coils, all right? And another frequency here. That's about 1.7K. All right, let's check out guitar B. Is this the same? Okay, this is a slightly different tone, right? Slightly cleaner, okay? So probably don't really need Do that again. 3.6. 660. That Very nice, okay. Let's just double check and see. All right, let's play that again. There we go. Now with these guitars, I don't think we need to do much actually. Don't even need to compress it at all. Now what um, one of the great things right with a lot of recording nowadays is that we can work with right a lot of VSTs with a lot of virtual amp and amp simulation has gone. It has grown by leaps and bounds. Okay, so now in 2020, 2021, you can get done really, really amazing sounds. Okay, so one of the great things is that um, it's been recorded with a DI track as well. So as you can see here, there's a guitar A which is running um, through the uh, uh, which is running through the amp, which is running I guess through the amp sims that that uh, that was bounced out right by um, by Ron from Dirt Star. So, but he's also giving me the DI tracks, and this is awesome because as a mixer, this gives me the flexibility. So if I find that maybe, you know, maybe the sounds that were given to me, I feel that maybe it's not working and, you know, whatever I do to it, it's not really getting the nice tone. All right, it's not really kind of nailing, nailing um, what I feel is necessary. There is the DI over here, which enables me to, right, um, enhance the sound. So when you record... All right, it's always handy to record with a with a DI track as well. 
you know, a DI box, you can always have, um, uh, you can always have one signal, right, coming out of the DI and record the clean DI signal. And then you output, you split the other signal out to your amp, right? Best of both worlds, you can always combine it, okay? So it's always good to have the flexibility, right, of reamp reamping it. So what I have worked out, I've worked on this on the earlier, uh, uh, prior to this, is I was playing around with the different sounds. So what I'm going to be using here, this is this is the uh, THU uh, Overloud. All right, this is the, let me bring this over here. This is the THU by Overloud, okay? So this one comes bundled along with the Slate Digital All Access Pass. And this is awesome, and you know, it's great. It's super, super awesome. Um, it's uh, it's not only got um, all these builds out of the built-in presets. You can see the bass phase. Uh, this is an angle, you know, fender, so many. But it's also something that we call the rig player. So this rig player, this is actually, this is actually like what a camper is. This is the the actual functions. It's like a, like a it does the thing that's similar to a camper. Right, you can capture the IRs of a specific rig, right? So inside this sample as well, there is tons of, tons and tons of uh, um, other um, uh, rigs as well. So you can see here, and these are just the ones that come shipped by default. You can see down here the ones that are not included that can be purchased, and there's so many others as well. So anyway, right, this is what I'm going to be using, lah. So I was dialing in this. This is a uh, DV Mark. I'm not sure what amp this is actually, right? So this is a um, it's probably a single channel amp. So what I've done is I really brought down the gain, so it's really low gain. Let's check it out how it sounds, all right? Let's check it out and let's see how it sounds. Solo, all right? So yeah. So this is the DI track. This is running through the amp. Okay, this is plainly through the amp, you know. And that's it. That's pretty much it, okay. I really love the sound of this, right. So it's a slightly dirtier, overdriven amp. Let's check it out how it goes. Going to blend this in. Something with a little bit more drive, you see. Okay, now same thing goes with this guy. I also use, uh, I think this one, I dialed in a little bit different tone. Now this one is a, uh, this is actually a triple rectifier. You know, it's unmistakable, uh, this diamond uh, faceplate of a Mesa Boogie triple rec. But the drive, again, very, very low drive, very, very low gain. Let's see how this one on uh, drive A looks, looks like, sounds like, not looks like. You can see how, you can, you can see how it looks like. Okay. Right, so this one, you're right, slightly more, you know, more of a, um, um, a different flavor of an overdrive, right? Right. Awesome. So let's see how all of them when they play together, okay? Let's go again. Sound pretty good when they're balanced this way. The clean-ish track, I have it a little bit slightly lower. Let's try it again. Don't 
need to roll up a bit of the bottom end from the uh, the the uh, the distortion B. Again. Okay, this guitar B I think could use with a bit of because this is like a clean track, it could use a little bit more compression, does it? Let's deal with it. And this bit of annoying thing at 800 hertz. Okay, I probably will need a little bit of compression. Let's go with let's go with the same thing, LA3A again. Great for clean guitars. This one will need to be a bit more aggressive. That's better, I think. Awesome, all right. Okay, cool, I'm liking it. A few things that I wanna check, first of all. I wanna double check one of these things. Now, um, you've probably seen that sometimes when you deal with, um, uh, when you do with some VST amps and re reampling, um, with with some reamping, you have to be very careful of the phase coherency of the two signals. So even though they are, they are, what do I say? They, in theory, they should be time aligned but sometimes when you're running through um, different processors what it can do is that all these different processors will report there will always be a little bit of latency so what happens when you're running through all this and the amp sim sim and everything there's a very possible likelihood that the the reamped track is going to be slightly later a little bit behind so i just want to double check and make sure okay it's always worth double checking this also happens as well whenever you're recording the same thing with the di and with the real amp the real amp track that's mic'd up will always be slightly delayed because first of all it's physics okay it's pure physics because the signal has got to go from the guitar into the di split out into the amplifier to the amplifier uh, circuitry then uh, from out from the amplifier into the speaker cones, the speaker cabinets. So you know you ha it has to physically move this, the uh, the magnet. No, no, the magnet doesn't. The magnet doesn't move. It has to physically move the the speaker coil, the speaker cone, and then microphone and all that. So that always takes a little bit of time, right? Uh, however few uh, microseconds that may take. So it's just worth checking. So what I'm going to do is there is actually a very, very useful tool, okay, that's by Waves. There are actually several, but Waves has got the most easiest ones to use. That's called Waves in Phase, okay. So what I'm going to do is just to double check and make sure that these two, at least the guitar A track and the, the DI track, which I've run through the um, uh, AmSim, I want to make sure that they are phase aligned like, because there can be sometimes be a huge difference when um, it can be a huge loss when something is something is not phase aligned properly. So how are we going to do it? It's very, very simple. All right. Um, it's You can see here, this is, says ready to capture. You can see channel one, channel two. Now this is the stereo. So what I do is guitar A, the original signal, I pan it to the left and the DI, the amp sim signal, I pan it to the right. So this will correspondingly uh, reflect on the uh, alpha and the beta channel, right? Channel one, channel two. So I just play it. Okay, let's play that section, the rhythm section. And then let's go capture. This takes a few seconds. And voila. And I'm not capturing it. Okay, why is that so? Because I think, yeah, I figured out why. Because this is not, not routed to the same channel. Let me do that first, okay? New mistake that happens to, to me as well. Okay, so now let's do that again. All right, let's run it. There we go. Capture. Okay, great. Awesome. So see, now it's captured right on both the channels. So what we're going to do is let's zoom in on the waveform. 
and sort of investigate. It actually sounds fine. It sounds great. It sounds good. But this is just to double check and to make sure that, you know, uh, that I'm hearing correctly. Lah. So let's look for a spot here. Let's see. Okay, so interestingly, okay, let me just take a look. Okay, so let's look at the, how the waveforms seem to be. Now, it's actually very hard to tell. But it seems like if I were guessing it, it there's a possibility that the actually the uh, the original Amtrak seems to be a little bit late. So what I will do is let's exp let's explore this. Okay. So what I will do is I will introduce a time delay on the uh, Amsim track. So let's bring pull this back a little bit. Let me just kind of look at. Let me just find a spot here. I'm going to pull this back and what I want to see is I want to look at the correlation meter. So the correlation meter here is the one that tells you whether something is in phase or out of phase. Right? So you know the phase coherency. Lah. So whenever it's, you see a positive value, it's a good thing. That means you have positive correlation, which is good. There's minimal phase cancellation uh, or, or phase issues going on. So at this point in time, it's giving if it's giving a good indicator, lah, right? blue and then a value of 0.18. What happens if we do this, right? So if it gets better or does it get worse? Let's draw, pull this. Oh, it seems to be getting better. 0 0.20, 0 0.22, 0 0.24, 26, 25. Does it get any better? No, it seems to go down again. So, all right, my guess is kind of correct. It, it is a little bit, right? As in the, the original track that was given by Ron, it seems to be slightly delayed behind. So again, I don't know. Uh, it could be an issue with the delay uh, delay compensation. So now what I'm going to do is with this, the DI track, which is running to the AMSIM, I'm going to have to push this back. And how many milliseconds is that? 0 0.61 milliseconds. Okay, interesting, right? So let's remember this value, 0.61, right? And let's bring this over. Okay, let me disengage the uh, plugin and uh, solo it. Now, so guitar DI, this one. So uh, this in Cubase, we call this section the inspector, but your DAW would probably have something similar as well. Or if it doesn't have, you know, you can always get maybe a sample delay plugin. All right. So what we're going to do is I will going to apply that same track delay. Remember the value? 0 0.61 milliseconds. 0 0.61. Okay. And let's check it out. All right. Let's listen to that section. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so 0 0.61, and I will be disengaging this. All right, so let's bring it back to zero. Zero. Let's try that again. Huh. I don't know whether you can hear this, but to me, it's a really clear difference between the two. Um, the, if, if we doubt this track delay, it's slightly hollowed out. But it's not necessarily a bad sounding thing, you know. It's not necessarily bad sounding. So again, maybe this is where it's handy. Let's listen in context. Let's make a decision in context, okay? So let's go with 0 0.61 delay in the, in the guitar track, in the uh, DI track. With no delay, zero delay. Hmm, interesting. I'm kind of torn between the two because both of them are one is not necessarily better than the other. So with the delay, when everything is a lot more phase aligned, uh, it sounds more coherent as one. But with without the uh, the delay, you kind of hear a little bit of separation between the two, which can be a good thing, 
which can be a good thing because this will sometimes make it sound a little bit bigger. Oh no, you know, it, this this is the beauty of uh, audio engineering and and mixing la. There are always rules. There's always technical guidelines that that say that oh, they should do this. Generally, you should have things in phase. But in this situation, in this instance, when it's slightly out of phase, it kind of makes the guitar a little bit bigger, a little bit better separation. So that's very important to always judge and to and to decide right with your ears. Okay. So, okay, I got a feeling. Let's go on. Let's let's go without it first and then later on we will swap it in and out and let's see okay so let's take that out okay we will investigate this later on now i want to very quickly do the same thing with the uh, b channel guitars as well right again just to investigate and make sure that we are right with the uh, arrive at the same conclusion okay capture okay all right okay Let's see. Now, this one seems to be different story. Seems to be giving a different story, okay? Here in this case, it seems like the B track is very, very much in aligned. So let's go, let's bring this back to zero. As you can see, the waveform, right? The top one is the uh, track that's given, uh, that was exported uh, by uh, Ron, by Dirt Star. And this is the one that's going to the amp sim. It seems to be, and it appears at first glance that, you know, this is all pretty much in phase. And the correlation meter kind of very kind of verifies that as well, right? So 0.57, that's pretty good already. That's pretty good, okay? Does it get any better? Uh, if I move it, okay. It does get a tiny touch better here with a difference of 0 0.02 milliseconds. That's very, very good. And nope, and it doesn't get any better than that. So that pretty much confirms it, okay? So maybe 0 0.02 is very subtle. 0 0.02 is like almost no difference, but let's keep that in mind, okay? So let's check it out again. Let's go back. Let's check out, so if I bring, introduce a track delay of 0 0.02. Wow, almost the, perf the it's, it's almost no difference. It's not really worth to, to introduce it. Lah. But let's just leave it, okay? Let's just leave it at that. So the B track seems to be very, very um, uh, in phase. That's fine. Just the A has got slightly different, but not a bad thing. Okay. So let let's use our ears and let's decide and and judge on what what is appropriate. Okay. Cool. Let's move on. Let's listen again back to the uh, guitars and uh, bass and everything. Let's just play that play back again from the start. Okay. It sounds very hard for it. So let me see where is that come. Okay. Nice.
Okay, cool. Right, sweet. Pretty happy with what we've got. All right, what else is happening and happening on in here, man? Okay, uh, da -da -da. bass and drums sound tight now. Hey, and uh, Ron has confirmed it. Telecaster played direct to the audio interface. Yep, yep, that's pretty much how I remember it. Awesome. So, I'm gonna skip all the uh, second gu the other guitars for now because there's actually one more guitar track because I want to move on straight to the vocal. And uh, the reason for that is being that you know the the expression that we always refer to is vocal is king that's the main thing that the a listener the casual listener um uh hangs on to that's what the listener picks up on that's what they are trying to listen so it's very important to always introduce a vocal very very early and when i mix right uh you and, and as i um and when i mix by the way uh okay hang on a second huh? and as i'm when I make you see that I always put a lot of emphasis on the vocal. So that's what we're going to do. I got an error from YouTube here saying that YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming as such. View... What? Okay. As such viewers will experience buffering. Hmm. Do you guys facing any uh, issues with the, uh, with the uh, internet connection? With, with, the, with the stream? Are you getting some uh, buffering? Uh, um... Uh, issues right because before that prior this first time ever ha uh, seeing this uh, error uh, message do you see so youtube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming let me know guys right if you are experiencing some buffering um, uh, issues like okay not sure this is the first time ever uh, seeing this uh, um, in like almost a year of doing this hang on a sec let me grab drink a bit of water i've been talking for like a good uh almost two hours already let's go with the vocals okay and uh dirt star says stream is working here so stream is fine yeah okay that's very that's good to know that is good to know all right so let's go with the vocal let's play around with the verse first of all so with vocals um i the way i describe my processing right um and it's much more clear when i deal with vocals um there's two types two categories of processing uh, one is what i call the corrective processing so corrective processing here means you know we are removing Right, you're removing all the ugly parts, all the warts, all the bumps, all the scrapes, um, things such as you know low frequency noise, rumble, stuff like that. A lot of that is usually dealt with um, in the at the earlier stage of uh, mixing. Uh, even parts of editing as well have to clean up all the different type of noises, um, mouth lip noises or anything sort of that. That takes that takes usually in the the first stage, then the second stage right is what we call creative processing. So, let's go with vocals. You can sort of see how it how 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 uh, I deal with that. Let's go first of all with the corrective EQ, right? Or corrective processing lah, because not not only EQ. So with vocals, I actually have a slightly different um, uh, processing chain plugin chain. Now this I start off with. Our good old friend, the TDR Nova, then with the tape machine, as usual, and virtual mix track. But the one thing that's different in virtual mix track in here is that instead of the 1073, I go with this. This is called the uh, Hollywood Virtual Tube Collection. So the 1073 the, um, um, is a solid state, right? It's not a tube uh, mic pre. This is a, um, it's not a specific model. They just, they just, just calls it Hollywood because it's a flavor of it. So this is a tube uh, preamp, right? So this is a model of a tube preamp. So I find that running the vocals through a tube preamp, right, is a lot more flattering this way. Like. So this is the only difference. So instead of an FG73, I use this instead. Okay, just to fatten up the vocals. And as you can see here, there's one additional thing. This is a, FG stress. This is their model of the empirical labs. This stressor. So what I'm running through this. This is actually a, I'm doing a parallel processing on the vocals. So you see, I did a little bit of the parallel, right? 
MV2 does a bit of parallel processing on the bass. Did I do a little bit of parallel on the uh, drums? A little bit, right? So on some of the room. I think I did a bit of a parallel. Okay, where, where, where's the drums? Let me take a look in here. On the drums, no, not much, right? The parallel processing is happening on the uh, the other on the on the other tracks, okay? Uh, not on the drum bus itself, but bass. There's a bit of parallel, and now vocal, definitely, right? Parallel here. So let's go back to this main vocal track, right? So this is running through a parallel, okay? Uh, processing 50-50. So let's listen to the vocal, right? Let's listen to it first of all. Let's turn off some of the process. Awesome. All right, cool. Okay, right. So, Rod, this was recorded back in your, uh, back on your place also, right? Okay. Can you hear a little bit of the room, <laughs> especially once, once you know all that compression is applied to it. But that's okay, man. That that that's perfectly fine. It's manageable. So, first instance, all right, would be our good old friend TDR Nova. By the way, again, as I mentioned, this is totally free. If you are checking this out, right, you can either search for it or the link is down in the description below. Right, you can go and download a the TDR Nova totally for free. So first things first, let's do a high pass, 12 dB per octave. Okay, let's bring it down to... Okay, so we just get get rid of some of that, uh, any of the low low frequency rumble there. Now let's just listen. Okay, all right, so now with this, let's go with the uh, narrowest Q, right, narrowest bandwidth, let's solo it. I can hear the room at about 720. See that 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 frequency, the doo -doo, that note. It it also does happen to be the note of that banali, so it's kind of exciting the 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 room right a little bit, but that's perfectly fine. Okay, it's it's it sounds pretty manageable. So let's engage the dynamic EQ threshold. Let's go into wide band mode. Let's go for three. Now with vocals, I will go for the fastest track. Fastest release as possible. It's 0.1 milliseconds and 10 millisecond release. Because what I want to do is I want the uh, dynamic EQ to react very quickly, but also let it go release re very, very fast as well. Right? Because uh, this will give you me a little bit more transparency. La. Okay, here we go. All right, okay, good. All right, this helps to kind of, you can see that it's a little bit aggressive. It appears like it's it's quite aggressive over there. But to me, this really helps to sort of notch out the room sound when whenever it's coming in. I can always kind of uh, bring out. Nice, okay, very good. And then there's another one up here. Let me just try and listen. At about 520. Okay, let's check it out. This one will be a little bit more uh, less drastic. Okay, let's go. I can go with a wider Q as well, the wider bandwidth. Okay, now one more thing. So typically, 
when any sort of vocal, when you whenever uh, vocals hit the higher register, you always get a little bit of that uh, harshness. So let's. Okay, especially when you hit the high note. Da -da. Okay, let me try and just loop this note. Okay, actually this one as well. Yeah, at about 4K. That's very typical. That's where the presence or uh, peak is, right, for the human voice. So at about between 3 4K, usually that's where it is. La. So this one will also go with the wideband mode. This one, again, with a slightly wider cue. This one, again, not much, just a tiny <coughs> bit. Just a little bit. So when you know, whenever the vocals go into the higher register, it will just kind of scoop out that three four K range a little bit just to smoothen it out, right? Okay, cool. Listen to it. okay okay very cool very cool pretty good right happy with the way it's sounding so the next thing that i have right we're still in the corrective eq stage uh actually let me bypass this first okay the next one i have is an instant of sibilance right so this is a deesser that came uh, that comes with weight waves this is just to catch some of the earlier sibilance okay let's just check it out man man yo -za. Okay, not much, just need to dial in a little bit of it, okay? Right, and the next thing that I have in here, this is an instance of a uh, Renaissance Compressor. So, uh, what this guy is doing here, right, is just going to be only just capturing the peaks okay so let's check it out right this is a fairly fast attack of uh, medium ish medium slowish release actually medium i would say you know 170 milliseconds a ratio of about 4.4 and what i'm trying to get with the gain reduction the attenuation here is just a little bit right only at the loudest points so let's see what it does ah! See, not more. The, the loudest part is just 1 dB, right? Just to kind of, again, like, um, to sort of nudge and to massage the, the vocal, especially when it hits the loud parts. That's all, right? Not more than a dB. Maybe some notes, some parts might go a little bit above, but that's what we're going for, okay? Just 1 dB. Nice, okay? So now once I got this, right, a... Uh, very very simply i'm just going to apply the same setting to the the other two uh layers because this is triple track okay right so it's great to have that kind of a sound so let's just copy it over right to vocal two and vocal three same one now but the eq for the doubles i will probably treat it a little bit differently i will probably want to take out a little bit more of this super bottom end and take out some of the top end And a bit more EQ of that. The yeah, at about 700. You know, that same room kind of a, a resonance that I could hear. But with the double tracks, I'll add additional EQ. Lah. Just, yeah. just scoop it out, okay? So let's do the same thing with the vocal 2, vocal 3. 
And let's bring this out slightly to the left and right. Let's see how it goes. Awesome. Nice. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so this is only half of the picture. We haven't gotten into the creative aspects yet. This is the first half is what I call the, uh, as I mentioned, the creative processing. Now let's go into the, uh, sorry, corrective processing. And now we're going to go into the creative processing side of the vocals. Okay, so creative processing. Now all the vocals are being sent to a big bus to the this group here. What do I have here? Now, a couple more other toys. First thing first, right? Let's compress it a little bit more, okay? So the 1176A in this instance, um, compressors are not only just used for level, it's also, also used for its tonal characteristics. And in here, the 1176 is gonna be used more, it's gonna play more of a role of adding the color to, to, the, to the vocal tone, right? It's not really there to control levels. Levels are pretty fine already, you know, I'm running it through parallel processing at the, at the start, and I'm also having that little uh, RCOM there just giving that 1 dB uh, tap, right, just to control a little bit. This obviously is going to control levels a little bit more, but it's more about the sonic character of the 1176 more than, more than just uh, uh, levels, okay? So let's check it out. Let's run it through. Gao Gao Fei Zha Tian Kong Zhong The Xiao Awesome. Ni wa do I hear like a low octave? The Xiao Oh, it's very cool. Ni <laughs> wa Okay, let's compensate the vocal level. Let's bring adjust the output. Gao Gao Fei Za Tian Kong Zhong. It's bringing out some of the room. I... It's bringing out some of the room characteristic, but again, I don't mind, man. Okay, this is this is this is perfectly fine, right? Uh, in fact, it it's it's it sometimes can be a good thing, right? It adds a little bit of that raw, rough around the edges kind of character. <laughs> Awesome, okay. So next thing I want to do, right, is I'm just going to add a little bit of that uh, EQ here. Just to, again, just give it a little bit of um, slightly more presence. Now, this e pull tech EQ is coming in in front of the Lambda 76. Now, I kind of like to do it this way. I want to set the compressor. I want it to act a certain way first. And then with the EQ, this EQ that comes before is going to push into the 1176. It's going to slightly alter the uh, the compression characteristic itself. But again, this is more, again, doing it for color. It's not really about um, uh, levels or controlling the dynamics. It's more about the color, okay? So what I want to do is I probably want to attenuate a little bit of the top. Okay, cool. Just a little bit. Take off the little bit of the top. Bandwidth, maximum widest bandwidth. Then let's go. Let's see which right frequency. This is uh, all in kilohertz. Kilo, kilo cycles. Anyway, this is this, you know, authentic to the uh, old fifties uh, and sixties of labeling kilo cycles. Ooh, that is. That makes it really. 
I like the 3K actually, right? It's really giving a bit of aggression. But let me just cycle through the different uh, um, frequencies. Three is four is good. Five is nice too. Isn't it? starts to give it a bit of a sheen you know there's a little bit of sheen on top which can be cool for pop but you know with this indie with more of an indie rock feel that we're going for you don't want it to be too you know too polished right it starts sounding a little bit polished you know like like you know um that typical pop uh, vocal super airy kind of a sound it's not really what we're going for here okay Bypass. Much more in your face, you see, just with that 4K. I think I like 4K. 4K is a good, a good uh, um, uh, region. You know, I think there is energy around that 4K, which is great. But uh, with the earlier um, TDR Nova, it's sometimes just too on some of the louder notes. Right, that energy uh, kind of overwhelms. Right, I thought it could be de depends on the mic. I thought it could be the preamp and and all that. There are many other factors as well. So you know, uh, let's let's add this energy back in, lah. Okay. Now there is a little bit of a vocal increase, so we will deal with that in a second. Let me bring this uh, the post fader marker. What I'm gonna do next is. Vocal rider. You see me earlier on I was using the bass rider for the bass. This is exactly the it's the same similar plugin, right? It's an intelligent plugin, uh, but tuned more towards vocals. Okay. So a couple of things that I wanna be a little bit different um, is that I want to set this range to maybe to have a 6 dB range. Um, that's very important because this is the range that you want the, the the rider fader to work la. too wide a range then it will go crazy right because it will just if it feels that it needs to bring the volume up then it starts bringing it up unnaturally so we've got to keep it within this particular range okay so let's try and look for a good target right target value Okay, right, see? So I just need to uh, compensate the output by about 1.5, minus 1.5 dB. Maybe 2 dB, I think. Okay, well, let me just dial off some of the 3K here. Awesome, okay. It really doesn't need to be to to have that much processing applied to it because the delivery of uh, of the vocals is really awesome, you see. That is there I've said it before. Um you the song arrangement and the delivery, the performance has got so much more impact on the outcome of the mix than any of the gear or the tips or tricks or techniques that we can apply, man. So this is awesome, right? The vocals have really got great energy and great vibe to it. So we're just bringing out more of that. That's all, okay? You don't have to go use drastic uh, techniques or measures to try and uh, to, to mess around. So same thing, right? Let's go with the super tap again, putting the vocals into a room. I know there's a bit of a room sound into it, but let's see. This one, I want to make it a little bit wider, okay? Let's just give it a little space to the, uh, to the vocal. 
天空中。Just a little bit. The shadow. 哎、okay, ，very cool. Next thing I want to add is a little bit of delay. Okay, so this is a mono delay that's going to be set to about eighth notes. Let's check it out. Okay, I want to jump back to the bass very quickly because I am still hearing a little bit of that、um, the fifth harmonic, I think, right? So let me just deal with that for a sec. Yeah, that about just to clean it up a little bit, to scoop out a bit of the four hundred hertz there on the bass. Okay, as I said, we set and we don't forget. We do a previous setting. And then sometimes when you introduce new parts, you find that oh, something else is not working together. So we need to go back and see what is it that、uh, that's kind of interfering. Which is this case, I still it's still the bass. Okay. Four was a bit too much, I think. So it's just minus two. Okay, on the bass. Right, super, super, super cool. Okay, now a few other things I want to play with is now、uh, in mixing. We one of the main things about a great mix is that you want to take the listener on a journey. You want the listener to always、um, have a. Pay off, so to speak, you know. So moving from the intro, moving to one section, the verse into the chorus, you want to use dynamics to draw the listener in to have the ear always be interested in、um, in the in、um, in things getting bigger, a little bit more intense. So there are many ways of doing it. So、uh, we can use it via,、um, via arrangement. Okay. So sometimes you know this means you know adding additional. Guitar parts. In this case, there's actually a second guitar which I haven't added yet, which will come in later. I want to work on the vocals first. But another thing is we can deal with. There are so many ways of adding the additional dy、uh, dynamics and and、uh, and dimension to the mix. EQ is one thing. Adding an additional part is one thing. But here we can also play with the vocal delay and the vocal effects. So in the verses, you can see that the delay is a mono delay. But once I kick into this section, I'm gonna bring in a stereo delay instead. Okay. So this is the same, same, same delay, but I have it to set to a stereo setting, and、uh, with instead of an eighth note, this is quarter notes. Okay, this is quarter notes. But let me, in fact, I want to tweak this a little bit. Let's do instead of quarter notes, let's go with a quarter dotted. Let's bring the offset. To about fifty and feedback. Okay, feedback. I've unlinked it. The quarter note will have to be a little bit longer, maybe about thirty to forty percent. The reason being because with a slower delay time, the the quarter dotted, it will feedback long. It will end up longer, so it means that the delay it will end up longer. See, on one side instead of the other. So let's bring this in. Let's check it out and see how it sounds. Okay, so this comes in in the chorus around.
Okay, you can hear that when I stop it. I think it's really appropriate as well. You know, it's a bit of a prosody. So prosody is like, you know, what it's like having the sound, you know, uh, nah, I'm kind of ruining it. I, right? If you're any literature uh, majors out there, are probably going to uh, get mad at me for explaining it the wrong way. But basically what, it's, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I'm trying to apply the effects to um, sort of mirror whatever the image because now the lyrics here in Chinese, it says, Fei, you see, flying, right? And that's the title of the song anyway, Gao Gao Fei, flying high. So, uh, adding that the stereo, stereo, stereo delay, especially on the long notes if, of that section, of that chorus, I suppose, okay, right? Uh, adds that impression, uh, it adds on to the meaning, it adds on to like right, um, the meaning of the word Fei, you see? So, I'll automate this, so here we go. Okay, here we go. Okay, right. Probably might need a little bit more, but let's see. Okay, don't do a little bit of editing here, just to tighten up the vocal. Okay, right. So some of the doubles are a little bit slightly ahead I just pull this back by a tiny touch just a tiny bit okay crossfade this section yeah okay so that the knee right hits much more on the uh, on the on the downbeat okay cool all right let's bring this in in fact, even this could come in earlier, the delay actually on this. Nah, I think it's just more more impact when there's a when there's no when there's no delay here, okay? So just coming in on here. Right, awesome. Okay, so this nah is also the double is slightly ahead. So let's just edit, edit it a little bit. I hope you don't mind. Nah, fei. Yeah, it's much more nah fei on the beat. Fei. Fei. Okay, here we go. So let's bring this feedback a little bit more. And also one more thing. Let's add a bit of distortion to this, uh, to this, uh, to the uh, delay. Okay, let's check it out how it's. Ooh, interesting. Okay, let's go back to where's the start of it. Let's go to eighty-five. Okay. Just give it a bit of distortion. Right, messing around with it first. Okay, now, okay, this is obviously a little bit too much, but I was exaggerating it because I needed to hear how it sounds. See how it sounds. Okay, 
Okay, I'm going to bring the left down a little bit more. Okay, that's better. Just down by 2 dB, because the right one still sounds seems to overpower it a little bit. Okay, let's listen to it again in context. And just to give it a little bit more oomph, I would probably even okay, compress it a little bit and I will use MV2. So MV2 will be great to bring up a little bit more detail. Where is it? Oh, waves, okay. Wrong, uh, wrong folder. Let's go with the MV2 just to saturate the, saturate so to speak, saturate the delay. Let's see how it goes. Check it out. Okay, I want to EQ this a little bit. At about 1.6k. Now, the delays sound too prominent, still sound a little bit too prominent. So what I will do is let's bump it and throw it into a reverb. And let's go with the Valhalla Supermassive. This is, I think this is actually also a free reverb. So let's check it out and see. Let's go with the uh, EQ. Let's take out all the 10K. Let's take out everything above 200. And let's see how it sounds. <laughs> that sounds a little bit. Let's take the density. Just to kind of... Just to kind of... Uh, just to kind of push it a little bit back. Not really. It's not really happening. Okay, let's go with just a plain old reverb. Okay, I think that works the best. Okay, let's just go with a plain old reverb. Simple, sometimes just works the best. Okay, let's check it out. That sounds a bit better. Take away some of the low cut. Awesome. Okay, so let's do the same thing with all the choruses. Awesome, all right, okay. Let me take out, I think we don't need this delay. Or just bring the level of this. I could prefer it with a little bit more reverb instead of delay. Okay.
awesome. I love all that, all that grit that's coming out of the vocal. Okay, let's go back to the start again, right? Let me just listen back to Alright, okay. I think here would be interesting if we were to put a bit of this delay into the guitar, right? This is a little reverse thing. around with a little bit of the and just to play around with the panning of this let's let me play around experiment okay let's start with here Awesome, okay, okay. I think I know what I want to do. Let's start with this. Let's start with this in the center. So then it slowly will go to, yeah, to the left. And then you will do a quick little sweep over to the right. And rinse and repeat. Okay, let, let's check this out, okay? Let's check this out and see how this sounds. Go, go, All right, okay. This is really, really uh, uh, a bit trippy. Hang on a second. Let me figure this out. Uh, okay, I got it. So this should go back here and... Then back here, let's have this kind of a... Alright, so from here onwards, I will just copy this particular setting so that it will be... Okay, so that it will... You see what I'm doing here, okay? Hang on a second, let me do this. And, uh, oh, does it do it this way? Nope. Okay, it looks like I gotta copy this, these four uh, automation points. Copy, it's right, bar 11. Yeah, that's more like it. Okay, then at 15. Okay, and then this starts back at bar 19. Yeah, all right. Okay, this obviously goes back to center and uh, center here, and we take out the delay, right? Very. Again, I'm playing around. These kind of ideas just pop into my head as the time goes or goes. And, uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. Later on, we will always adjust this and play around. You know, in the process of mixing, you know, where we, when we deal with the clients later on, we always present it later on once once we're done, we're happy with it. And we see, right, with digital, with digital, um, with digital audio, everything is non-destructive. 
So you can always, you know, go back. You can always take away whatever you don't like or whatever is too too excessive, lah. Right? Everything is so much flexible these days. Take out the uh, automation. So when it gets to the line, it should be no delay. Okay, let's automate the delay out. It should even be a clean. Even earlier, I think. Yeah, that sounds better. And let's rinse and repeat this. So every time we've got that the the swell and the reverb, uh, the reverse guitar um, effect, we do that. Okay, let's activate this. Okay, let's take out the reverb here. Let's give it a bit more. Okay, we copy this over to bar 29. Let's see, where should this go? Well, let me just listen to it for a second. Okay, so we take this out. You see, the reason why I'm putting this little panning, uh, auto panning thing here is that if I kind of keep the guitar at the center, it's kind of occupying the same space as the vocal. And you got all that space around it that's not being used. So why not let the guitar kind of move to the sides, you know, take space around the sides so it gives space for the vocal to occupy in the middle as well. That's what I think. At least that's what I think anyway. All right. So this would should be... Like, why does this not behave this, the way that I expect it to be? This should be all the way up. So it goes to the side, back to the left, and a quick sweep to the right. Alright, okay, so here's where the second guitar comes in. Let's check it out, okay? So guitar 2. So you have the rhythm, you have the main lead. So what does guitar two do? Yeah, okay. It's kind of doubling the 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 root note. Okay, so let's give it a little, little bit more of uh, interest. Okay, let's go with the FG two A. This is a LA two A emulation of the. Uh, uh, this is Slate Digital's emulation of the FG2A. Let's see how it goes. Let's just dial it down so it's a tiny bit. Okay, all right. Let's give it a bit of delay. Good old delay. Same thing, baby audio. Let's go with the baby come back. A triplet is a dotted delay. Or... Let's go with the analog delay sound, which is. Let's check it out.
Okay, let's check it out. Okay, so Guitar 2 actually comes in here as well. Okay, very cool, All right? Uh, we could use back the same settings. It sounds perfectly fine. Okay, a bit of this EQ needed. 1.9, it's about 2K. Now, if you are listening to this on headphones, that could be pretty loud, okay? Take out 3K here. Okay, not too much, just a little bit, okay? Okay, this one, the 2K is the one that... And the 1.6. 3K, I don't mind. There we go. Let's go with the right instead. Yeah, let's put it to the right. The reason why, because I have the hi-hat on the left, so we have this on the right, you have a bit more motion that way. Hi-hat can go a little bit louder now. So guitar one, panning it to the left, right? Because guitar two is taking up the right. Let's have guitar one go to the left. Might need to bring it down a little bit. Let's see. Just by a tiny touch. Just one or two dB will do. Just one or two dB. Nothing super dramatic or drastic. In fact, let's give it, make it even wider. Let's go to 75. All right, let's go to 75. And guitar two can be brought up slightly and wider. Oh, I think just making it wider already kind of helps it to st stand out a little bit more. So level-wise, okay, we should be pretty fine. So you see, when we get into the chorus, not only are you adding more elements, but everything, you know, from a much more centered kind of uh, where the guitars are, starts to pan out to the wide. So this creates, you know, dynamics in the song. Makes the chorus wider, bigger, is it? I might even want to do it with these vocals. So let's experiment. Let's play around. Okay. okay I'm going to push them out uh, slightly to the side. About 50-50. So let's see how it sounds. Huh? Okay. So every time it gets to this, it will be slightly wider. Everything will be wider. Everything will be a little bit bigger, is it? Okay, and where does this start off with? 30, right? 30, and this goes off to 50. Okay, uh, I can sort of hear that. Yeah, this same thing again. Let's... Bring this a little bit further to the back. Just by a tiny touch. 
a tiny, tiny, tiny touch. Crossfade. Then bigger. Let's bring it back down to the middle. So again, dynamics again. So this goes back down to left 30. Let's do the same thing. When you get here, this widens to 50. Might go a little wider later on. Let's see how lah. Okay. Let's see how lah. That is Malaysian slang. Okay, let's automate this again. So the guitar one needs to. Okay, let's go. Needs to go back to the center. Center, hello, center. Okay, looks like my mouse, uh, my mouse position is not as good. Okay, never mind. Let's do it the hard way. Key it manually in. Uh, automate this back to ten dB for these lines, right? So you should occupy the center back again. Okay, and we are back to this, uh, yeah, we're back to this automation thing. So let's do it. Let's do this. Let's copy. Da, 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 da. Okay, there, right? Add bar number 69. Okay. No 69 jokes, please. Okay, he's doing the panning thing. Okay, and this means that we need to introduce back the delay right here. Yeah, okay, going. So the delay, yep, it needs to cut out a little sooner. Okay, same treatment. We need to bring this over to 75. Keep it to the right. Okay, making space. Okay, right. So here is a little bit more intense. Let's see whether can we keep it to the side. So let's bring the uh, guitar one back to the middle, right? Because it's kind of taking the lead. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It, it belongs in the middle, uh, definitely. Oh, 
awesome. Okay, right. I'm hearing a little bit of that. What was that sound? that sound coming from? You hear that tick tock? <laughs> oh, it's coming from the bass actually. A little tick. Is that, is that the, uh, is that the click track leaking? It does sound like the click track. <laughs> Hang on a second, eh? There you go. There you go. You can hear it. <laughs> you can hear the click track over there. Okay, let me just deal with this. Let me just deal with it for a second. Just automate it out, lah. Okay. There we go. There, it's gone. Okay, got rid of, got rid of it. Somehow the click, click was a uh, click was there. How were you record? How was the bass recorded? I run, I wonder, run. Yeah. And we are almost, almost there actually, right? Thank you so much, guys, for you know still staying, staying, uh, sticking around with it, with with me. Now a couple more things that I wanna show. And uh, this was something that uh, Ron actually added as well. Now, when you get to the choruses, there's actually an additional sub bass. Okay, let's check it out. Let's check out how this sounds. So this is actually a uh, quite a common trick that you can not a trick. It's it's a technique, uh, so to speak, that you can always add size to. Again, as I said, mixing, when you go into the chorus, you want everything to be lifted up. Everything needs to be bigger, it needs to be wider. Frequency-wise, more parts as well. Um, you add some parts on the top. But very often, sometimes we add stuff on top, you know, occupying the mid-high frequency. Sometimes we forget that dynamic-wise as well, we, we kind of neglect the bottom. So this here is very useful, it's handy. Uh, to sometimes add a little bit of a sub bass to it. So just have a listen to how this sub bass goes. It's again super subtle. Right? That's all it is. Just like a synth bass. Okay, but what I want to do is I really want to drive and saturate this, right? So it's going to be a long sustain to it. So let's roll this all the way up. There you go. In fact, I feel we could even go way crazier and let's just really bring up the sustain of, of all this. There we go. In fact, it's even got this kind of a pumping. Let's try again. Let's try again. Let's check this out. Very cool. What this, what the bomber is doing. <laughs> That's a very cool effect, man. Listen in context. Now, what I would want to do is actually want to kind of stereoize this. Because not only do I want it to be center, I want it to like go a little bit wider as well so again a big wide bottom end so let's go with ozone's imager let's try and stereoize this space okay here we go let's go with maximum amount here we go man that is awesome stereo bass Okay, let's let's 
working. I will probably just want to take off this again some of the super super lows. Can let's go in even more with the envelope shaper. I want to take away a bit of the attack. So I don't want it to be too. You know, I want it to have a bit of a more rounded. Okay, that's a bit too much. Let's go with the length, I think. Yeah. Give it a bit more sustain. Let's dial back down the... There you go. It's much more softer. Okay. Because I don't want the attack on the synth bass because that is really coming from the kick drum and the bass guitar. I just want this to fill up the bottom end, you see. Okay, you're right. Here we go. So let's blend this guy in. Now, this is going to be, again, very subtle. Uh, you don't want to overdo this. And this is not necessarily appropriate for every style of, of a music, right? Only in certain occasions that this will be applicable. Ooh. You see, that really fills up the bottom end it's in a really, really awesome and cool way. I feel it needs a bit more sustain though, and how I'm going to do that is with our good friend MV2 again. Now, this one, I'm probably going to crank this up really high. Alright, let's try and do this. Okay, that's kind of distorting, clipping it as well. A bit of high level. Okay, okay, let's bring the output down. Right, just to give it that more sustain. And I'm curious, actually, if I want a bit more sustain, Bass Rider actually will do the job, okay? Bass Rider can actually do the job really, really well. So let's go with Bass Rider Stereo. Let's keep the, let's keep the, uh, let's keep the range all the way to the maximum. Let's see what happens, okay? Let's find the right target. Ooh, okay, now it's doing something a bit weird. Let's go with slow response. Let's go with higher sensitivity. Hmm, it's, yeah, it's doing something a little bit weird though. Yeah, so see, sometimes it will jump that way. Okay. Bring the sensitivity down. Okay, that's much better, I think. Yeah, just want to give it a bit more sustain. Let me turn out the vocal. A couple of things I want to check. I want to check the phase of the sub bass along with the bass guitar. I want to make sure that we're not cancelling each other out. And okay, it's fine. All right, we're safe there. All right, they're not doing any kind of cancellation. 
excellent. So the, at least the base is playing well together with each other. So this happens as well. Next one. Okay, and then at this end. We don't need this note. Hey, <laughs> very cool, very cool, all right? I feel that we could still use a bit more distortion. <laughs> okay, my te temptation is to really just add a bit more of the distortion. And let's let's try and just check it out, see. Compensate. Let's bring the feedback down. Check it out. Yeah, a bit more distortion. A bit more of that grit. Right, kill here. The tiny bit of automation more. Okay, now all these the drive guitars. I think when it gets to the chorus again, give it a bit more, a slight nudge. Not much, just one dB. Back down. Same, repeat the same thing. Alright, there we go. 1 dB all the way to the end. Okay, very cool. So we're adding a lot more stuff, right, to the chorus, giving dynamics to it. Now, there's one more thing, which uh, last thing that I want to add, only a few more stuff. Um, I took the liberty of actually um, adding a tambourine loop to the choruses. Now, uh, because we have a lot of the low frequency energy, we have a lot of the mid-range energy, but sometimes just adding a little bit of percussion here will really help to lift the dynamics of the chorus. So now, um, this is something we can always take it out if you know if we don't want it, right? But let's just play around with this, okay? Because I feel that this could help. So this is actually a tambourine loop, right? So let me just build it down. And I pretty much know I will want MB2 on it to bring out some of the, this is like a 16th note uh, pattern. Uh, and where is MB2, mono, okay, this is just going to dial in very, very soft. This is not going to be prominent, okay? That's all it does. That's all it's doing. Just adding a bit of that high frequency uh, energy to to the to the mix. Put a bit of reverb to it. MB2 to bring out the softer hits. There we go. Yeah, keep it to the center. Oh. 
or slightly to the right. Now it feels like the toms need to be a bit more impactful now. Yeah. Okay, and how we will do that? Okay, it feels like it just needs a little bit more, slightly more punch to it. And the way we can do it is again with in DSPL transient designer. Actually, we can just use attacker, as attacker is actually just the transient uh, portion of the uh, of transient designer. So let's just use this just to give a bit of. Just a bit more twack to it. Yeah, just a tiny, tiny bit. Okay, so we can bring this back down to about seven. Okay, a couple more things that I want to add with the vocal. Let's give it a bit of chorusing, a little bit of a doubler. play around with one more thing especially when the uh, there's the reverb thing going on let's just add a effect to it okay we're just playing around with this okay so this one is uh, under waves guitar what I want to just dial in a little bit of a like a pitch shifter so pitch shift up Yeah, this is just adding a pitch shift. In fact, hmm, in fact, we can actually let's go crazy. Let's add one more. <laughs> so it's like two octaves up. Okay, so let's go crazy here. All right. <laughs> okay, it might be a little bit too extreme, okay? Let's listen in context. See, I don't know, to me it adds that little bit of a, almost like a pad kind of effect. So this without, this with, see, two octaves above. Okay, again, this is very subtle in context of the mix, right? It just kind of sounds like a little texture going on there. Now, obviously, this will be bypassed when it goes to the line. Bypass. Man, man, 
Right, so every time this kicks in, like the pitch shift will also engage. And hello, how do we get out of this? Oh, there we go. There we go, that's how it is. So same thing goes here. Okay, right. One last thing. Okay, actually not one last thing. I keep saying one last thing, right? Let's let's move on back to a couple of things first. I want to go back to my stereo bus because now I want to kind of uh, play around with the show you a little bit of what I do on the stereo bus processing. So I'm going to go to the loudest part of the song, which is this last chorus here. So this is my stereo bus, some of the processes that I have this. Now all of these were already on, so I was actually mixing through them. Now if you want to find a little bit more, actually you hit on, I have a video on my channel which lays out in detail about the project template and all and, and all that. So I won't spend too much time on this. But first thing here, there's this little air EQ just to give a bit of that air here. Very, very mild, 1 dB. All right, just a 1 dB boost. So the next thing is this Wave C4. So this is on a multi-opto setting. This opto setting, what this C4 is doing, it's just, again, massaging the, the so that no particular frequency band will poke out too much. So this is how I'm going to dial it in, okay? All right, this is super, super subtle. I just want to see the little line just dance ever so slightly, okay? Me Let's bring the threshold down. You can see the highs are moving a bit. Then that's it, right? Just very, very, very slight. Okay, now the next thing I will skip. This is TDR Nova, which uh, I have there sometimes um, if I need to do some kind of a problem solving, but 99% of the time it's not used. But what I have next here is the virtual bus compressor. So this is some of the bus compression which we're going to apply. Um, this is laid out in series with firstly, it's an FG grade, it's an SSL. FG rates a focus right compressor and FG mu. This is a fair child, right? A variable mu compressor. What I've dialed in with all of these, right? Uh, compressors later on, I may tweak around with the attack and release as well. What I want to do with all these is just to have each one work very, very lightly, not more than one dB. Okay, so this is overall how how I love to apply these compressors. Okay. <laughs> Just a tiny touch, tiny, tiny bit. See, obviously when it gets to the second half, it goes... Now with a very mu, just dial it in. I love the bass, man. I love what it's doing it. So yeah, each one's just going doing a little tiny bit, less than one dB, all right, of a compression each. 
now another tool that I've been using recently, I would love to add the, uh, this is SPL Iron. This is another mastering processor. Again, all of these are doing super, super subtle moves. So instead of having one bus compressor that's doing like three, four, five dB of compression, I'm having all these in series. Each of them is doing a particular thing and it's very, very subtle, very gentle. Each one is doing not more than one dB. So this is been something I've been using quite recently. Not really, like, I guess maybe um, coming up to about a year right now. This is an awesome co mastering compressor because it uh, has what we call the uh, MS mode, okay? So this is goes into M and S, mid-side mode. So where it processes the mid and the sides information uh, uh, separately this one once i use this it gives it just gives it that super additional width and separation i don't know how to explain it there's some magic going behind it so so it's just very subtly kind of opening everything a little bit wider you know, a little bit more separation over the sides and, and, uh, and the mids. And the uh, great thing is it also has got this um, uh, tone control. So this is like air base if I want to give it a bit of an air base smiley curve. But there's also a tape roll off signature. So let's do it a bit of tape roll off. Let's listen. I like this. This is flat. No, with the air base, it gives a little bit of a smiley face EQ. Nah, not really appropriate for, for this style. So I go with the tape roll off, okay? Again, just to give it a bit more edgier kind of a sound. And almost there. One thing here that would be UAD's 560. This is something that I learned watching um, another master engineer. He just runs it through this. There's no processing whatsoever, no EQ on this. This is purely just running through the API 560 uh, circuitry, okay? And one last final thing that I want to show. We're almost, almost at the end, man. Okay, so another thing, same thing that I mentioned about automation and using it to introduce and bring dynamics to the mix. So this is what I'm going to do. I'll show you. Okay, so this is a very common trick, okay? Um, we're gonna automate the master. So this is what happens, okay? So every time when the song kicks into the chorus, I'm gonna bump the master up by one dB. It's super subtle. Again, we are playing again with these. It's a psychoacoustic phenomenon. We ears hear it as something louder, as being bigger and better. So we're doing it in such a subtle way that, right? One dB in this case on the master fader, uh, it's not going to sound like obviously someone turned up the volume. It's very, very subtle. And we also ramp up to it, you see. So it's a gradual ramp instead of a sudden jump. So this is how we do it. Okay, let's go. Coming up from here. Let's automate. Okay, ready? One, two, three, four. So, right, so that one bar, we ramp it up over that one bar, you see. So this goes here, one, two, three, two, three, four. Then on the on the one beat of the chorus, it go it bump up by one dB. Super simple trick that you can try on any of your mixes, okay? To just to get that little bit of extra dynamics into it. So coming up the chorus, same thing, we bring it back down. Okay, so this one will be a little bit shorter. This can be, we ramp it down, but over a period of just two beats here. Okay, two beats. Here we go. Okay, we can copy this and do the same thing. There we go, bed bar 84. Oh, hang on. Oh, this is much shorter. So this is only a one bar thing. So let's put it here. Now, obviously, since this is the last chorus onwards, we don't need to bring it back down. We just keep it at 1 dB all the way. So again, 
makes the ending and the outro sound louder than the than the intro, you see. So that's where you have natural dynamics. Awesome. I am pretty happy with it, okay? Uh, hopefully, Ron, if you're still listening and watching this, I hope you're you're liking what you're hearing as well. Um, now, this is pretty much right. Uh, coming to, we're coming to the end of the live stream already. Um, at this stage, right, uh, I would say this is what I would call the first draft of the mix. I consider this maybe at about 85-90%, close to close to 90% um, uh, of the way to where the final mix is going to be. Usually at this stage or point, you know, we are kind of like going three-ish, four hours into the mix. It's already time to go and take a little bit of a break, lah, right? It's important to always take frequent ear breaks because if you listen to a particular sound, like loud volumes for extended period of time, right, your ears will get fatigued. But um, for me, I'm still good actually because um, again, like I mentioned, I've calibrated my listening level so that it's at about 85 dB SPL, right? So very, very consistent around every time I mix so I won't get fatigued that easily, lah, right, that quickly. So at this stage, right, I would usually let it sit for a while um, either go off for a break and or sometimes even if I'm busy doing something stuff, I'll come back like the following day or maybe if I you know or following night, give a couple of hours break in between and then come back to it, re re revisit it, listen back again. Oftentimes there will be a little bit of few things here I'm gonna tweak here and there. And uh but i I feel like it's kind of eighty five percent, you know, maybe even as as high as ninety percent there already. Okay, so this will be the first draft. And usually the process after this with the uh, artist or with the client is we'll sit down and then, you know, we'll uh, let the client listen, let the artist listen to it. And if there are any more, and, uh, and we'll do any kind of tweak, we'll sit down and, you know, make any sort of a tweaks and adjustments uh, that's necessary. Lah, okay, so that's the process. Now, if I were to really show you everything, the whole thing, it will be way too long. Okay, It would probably take around five to six hours. And that's the longest stream I've ever done <laughs> was on one project that took six hours. But that was a song that had like 140 tracks. Uh. There was like an epic uh, uh, progressive uh, folk rock uh, uh, band that I did in one of the earlier episodes of Mixed Stream. So now we're going to take a listen to the mix. This is, I would consider, the first draft, almost near completion, final draft of the mix. If you want to hear the actual song once the file um, is out, follow, right, uh, Dirt Star. Okay, follow their account. They will, and their social media is all in the link below. They will definitely, right, Dirt Star will definitely keep you uh, informed and updated when the real track is out, okay? Right, so, now... Thank you again so much for watching. Every one of you who stuck around right these couple of hours, you guys are champions. You guys are real, real soldiers. Lah. Thanks for keeping, um, uh, watching the live stream. And thank you to so all the folks that are in the live chat. All right. Um, everyone awesome all the way from Indonesia, from Germany, all the way, right, even down here in Malaysia as well. Thank you so much for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and watching this. Um, if you found this useful and you found this uh, entertaining, now, um, this will always obviously be on the YouTube channel. You can always go back and I'm going to be putting in the timestamps of all the different uh, um, sections and the parts of the song. So, for example, when the part if I'm talking about bass, right? right later on in the description, you can always just go back, click on the timestamp and it will take you to that portion. Uh, later on, or for example, maybe the part about vocals, you want to you want to just go in. So instead of having to search around, you can just click on the timestamp. I'll have those timestamps up for you. Okay, uh, later on down when when once I've uh, uh, once the video goes into the uh, playlist uh, okay of YouTube that usually takes a couple of hours. Um, if you found it useful, informative, you really enjoyed uh, what I've been uh, sharing with you, please do leave a like. Uh, do share this with your friends or anybody who you know might be interested in uh, uh, mixing, recording, music production, or any such uh, related topics. And if you are, if you're not a subscriber yet, all right, do click on the subscribe button, which is down below. That will really, really be awesome. I really appreciate it. And uh, last but not least, once again, if you would like to support all right, the channel, all right, uh, financially and also support the featured artists, do consider, check it out, okay? The Patreon, I have a Patreon page. So patreon.com slash studio2105. If you 
Um, sub, if you join as a patron um, and you use the code, right, drop a message with the code mixstream 21 mixstream 21 so that I know that your contribution is going to go towards Dirt Star, okay? So 50% of the revenue will go towards the featured artist. You can join for as low as a dollar a month or uh, all the way up to $10 a month. Um, you have all the special v uh, perks and benefits, for example, one-on-one -on -one tutorial mentoring sessions. You get, you know, discount codes they can use towards any of the studio services here. You just check it out, okay? All, all of the information is stated up there in the, in the website, in the Patreon page, okay? Thank you so much. Dude, go and check out Dirt Star's uh, other tracks, right? All the social media and all the links. Follow Dirt Star on... Uh, they have... Um, he's got plenty of other tracks as well up on, up on SoundCloud and Spotify, I suppose. Links are all down in the description below, okay? So... Well, let's take a listen right to the, what I would call maybe the first draft of the mix of Kao Kao Fei by Dirt Star, okay? Thank you, you guys have been awesome. Let's take a listen. Here we go. Thank you very much, guys. You have been an awesome, awesome uh, uh, audience. Take care, all right? Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, all right? See you next time. Um, Till next time, happy recording and mixing. Um, peace, love, and music. Good night. <laughs>